All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is December 10th, 2023, and we've got another exciting teaching tonight. We're going to we're going to go off a, a little bit different from what's been taking place lately with all of these revelations from from the 153 fish and their connection to the end of tribulation uh, uh, from the revelation of the beast and mystery Babylon. But it's still, of course, connected. We are a prophecy ministry after all. The books have opened and they continue and continue and continue to open. Well, there have been a number of videos over the past uh, couple few weeks or so shared in the forum. For those who are wondering what the forum is when you hear me speak about it, you can go to ministryrevealed.com and you can come into the menu box and you can click down here on the forum. It'll take you a couple seconds to sign up. There's no charge, nothing like that. And you can come and join us. There are just about 1,200 people worldwide, and people are posting on events and, and news globally and prayer requests and, and all sorts of things going on in there, uh, Bible studies and questions and all sorts of things. So you can come and join us in there, like-minded brothers and sisters uh, from all over the world. And there had been posts in there recently um, from a great website, uh, a great YouTube channel called One for Israel. And... It was really exciting because it's something we've been talking about here for, oh, at least a couple of years that I made it public. And it's it's a touchy subject, but you're about to see. And the reason I'm saying this is because it does kind of tie in to parts of what I discussed in the last video. It's something that I tend not to share on too much because people can't grasp it. But I want you to be able to see that we're not the only ones that understand this about the Messiah, that there's something else that's taking place with the Messiah and old rabbinical writings knew it in from Old Testament writings to what we know in the New Testament. But there's one thing that that this I don't know if he's a scholar or what he is on one for Israel, who's really, really messing with them. Like and when I say that, I don't mean in a bad way. I just mean that the, the main guy is just so blown away from what he's hearing. And we can prove it and have proved it here in this ministry. And what this guy talks about, who's written a book on it, who has essays and things and, and things that he teaches on about it, we can take it a step further, as you know, because there's something about it that hasn't happened yet. And we understand it. But I'm going to let you listen to him talk, which is one of the things we're going to go into a little bit as we go maybe halfway through and get into it, because he's going to lay out things that we haven't fully understood. But as he's explaining it, you're going to see this connection to the ox and who this ox connection is connected to, meaning who does it go back to historically and why? And this is something that had always baffled me because you know, we've talked about this Messiah ben Joseph and the Messiah ben David. How is Jesus both of them? Well, we're going to cover that today. And you're going to see, as we've taught on, we know that something still needs to happen. So we're going to get into that. It's going to be a, it's going to be so exciting to be able to see it laid out and spoken about by somebody else that we can take it into the New Testament and into the Old Testament and confirm these things that he's talking about from teachings that we've done. And you're going to hear my voice is a little bit raspy. Uh, I was we, I did a Zoom call today with our with our new brother, uh, Olu, uh, who's from the U.S. And man, you want to talk about a brother that's excited, who's digging into the revelations. He's understanding it. We were on uh, a Zoom call for like three hours. So my throat's already a little bit raspy, but I love it. We'll get through it. This this is the stuff we can do all day long, all day long. So we're going to get into it. And before we get to that, I'm going to get into a video that I uh, uh, that was shared from Deep Believer. And it was about a woman who had gone to heaven. And, you know, we're always cautious with these types of things. But I wanted to share some points that she talks about in there. And I'm going to start from the end of the video because... I don't think it was done on purpose, but it's almost like she goes, she like she starts with the end, then she goes to the middle, and then she goes to the pre. 
it's pretty wild. I didn't notice it till I went and looked in my notes to see where I wanted to share from the video. And I realized that if you take it in reverse, it's post mid or, or it's pre mid post. It's like Matthew, Mark, Luke, but Luke, Mark, Matthew in reverse, just like we show in the revelation of the gospels. So it's really cool. So we're going to get into that. Um, and then we're also going to touch on something else in the beginning, just something brief as well to show this, this time frame connection in the is to come that we know is coming from the time of, of middish seals related to the Muslim portion and the antichrist and so forth coming. But what came first? And you'll see what I'm talking about when we get there. So for anybody that's new to the ministry, and you're going to hear some wild things uh, in this video. You're going to hear some very wild things. So what I would recommend you do before even watching the rest of this video, you can watch it if you want. You'll be able to follow along if you're diligent in your scriptures. But I always recommend everybody go to this playlist. You can watch it on YouTube right here. Go to this video playlist right here, the Revealed End Time Study Note series, and watch at least the first four videos. You can also go to ministryrevealed.com where I am here. I'm on the intro page, which if you go to the menu, you can click right here. <clears throat> and when you scroll down, this is video number one. It's a 22-minute intro video that breaks down the next three videos that follow. This one is the first of the next three that follows, and it will reveal to you in a 30-minute Bible study, just to give you the introduction to it, the differences within the Gospels that people have thought were contradictions, that the church tried to explain away by saying it was just perspective. You're going to come to see for yourself that it's all about prophecy. It's going to blow your mind. You're going to see something simple like one of our favorites, but very simple, is Jesus before going to the cross was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, it said, which means a white, radiant, beautiful robe. That's in Luke's Gospel. In Mark's gospel, before going to the cross, he was arrayed in purple. In Matthew's gospel, he was arrayed in a scarlet robe. And you think, what? What's going on here? Well, when you understand the differences of who the gospels are speaking to and understand that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the synoptic gospels in the end of days is Luke, Mark, Matthew. The first will be last and the last will be first. Pre, mid, post are all true. And you're going to begin to understand this, just like a white, radiant, gorgeous, beautiful robe is for the bride, purple and scarlet are tribulation colors, as you know, by reading the book of Revelation. These types of things and more within a 30 minute Bible study, you will see all laid out in Scripture. Then what you're going to realize is that the end of days is not seven years, but 14 years. And it's the revelation of the differences in the Gospels that will prove it to you. That the 14 years of the end of days, it is two sets of seven. And when you see it's seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets, you'll realize it's seven years of Mark's group and seven years of Matthew. Luke's is the pre-trib bride of Christ. Mark's is for the, the house of Israel with the Gentiles grafted in, the church, which is asleep, which aren't prepared for what's coming. They're the ones that will go through seven years of seals. And the seven years of trumpets are for the house of Judah. Now, what you're also going to notice is that what happens then, <clears throat> excuse me, to the house of Judah, well, the seals are taking place. Well, they're removed from the land for seven years. And while they're removed from the land, the seals tribulation takes place against the church. So it's pretty wild. It's all revealed. And this is just a 30 minute intro Bible study to begin to prove it. But there's no way you can get to it without first understanding the differences in the Gospels. From there, we go to the big video. This one is about two hours, 45 minutes, and it's the answer to understanding how this was missed. And it's all because of Matthew. We've all for hundreds of years have been taught from the foundation of the gospel of Matthew. So unbeknownst to everybody, thinking that Mark and Luke and the synoptic gospels were just another point of view from Matthew and maybe fill in some of the blanks, it was never understood what the purpose was for those gospels except why not just put it all into Matthew and give us the rest of the details. The evidence will show to you that the reason for not having understood is one, yes, because it wasn't the Lord's timing to make it known, but two is because we have all been taught for hundreds of years 
from the Gospel of Matthew, and we only look to Mark and to Luke for little fill-ins of the gaps. And the understanding of the differences were never made known, and hence, everything we see comes from a seven-year perspective, which is the seven years of trumpets for Judah, because it is seven years of trumpets for the house of Judah. But unfortunately, the church has missed within it that there are seven years of seals that come first. So you can come here, watch those first four videos, and then you can start to go deeper. This is a three-hour video approximately going into the deeper revelations of the differences in the Gospels. You'll see the discourses like you've never understood them before. Luke's is a period of time of 40, 50 days, and then you'll understand Mark and Matthew of seals and trumpets. You'll understand pre, mid, and post and typologies of the triumphal entry, the transfiguration, the resurrection. It's everywhere. You'll see the tribulation, the, the book of, uh, of Revelation revealed like you've never been able to follow and understand before. The seven churches revealed in the end of days will blow your mind. And it just keeps going and going and going. And this is a crazy one, too. It's all a fractal reveals the beginning of creation right to the end of tribulation right to the end of the millennial reign. It's that wild. So I always recommend everybody do that first, either on the website or from the YouTube channel. So with that, sip of coffee time. With that, I wanted to share something. This came in, I, I think this was, who was this? Uh, our brother uh, Isaiah, I think, shared this with me, if I remember correctly. This was really interesting. Now, he was he was sharing it in relation to something in the end, in relation to to uh, the B system and everything else and their destruction at the end and and why all the burning takes place. But what I noticed was something really interesting in this. And I want to share it to show you the timing within the is to come of the end of days. We've understood it very, very well. We've got it here in the seven churches. This is from the Ministry Revealed book. You can get it from the website. You can download it for free as well. You don't have to pay for it. <clears throat> Excuse me, unless you wanted a paperback from Amazon, then of course you'll have to pay. But we reveal on page 128, but I think it starts earlier, of course, the seven churches of the end of days. We can see them in the was, we can see them in the is, and we reveal them in their is to come. So the was is from the beginning of creation until Christ. The is is from his death and resurrection until the pre-trib. And then after the pre-trib is the is to come. So the was, is, and is to come. Everything is in threes. Pre, mid, post, father, son, holy ghost, was, is, is to come, Satan, antichrist, false prophet. <clears throat> it's everywhere. It's all throughout scripture. But I wanted to show you the connection to the timing. And it's something we've shared recently. When it comes to these years in the is that we're living in since Christ, these years in these time frames of years, they're not exact. They're approximate time frames. Okay. So there is always going to be an overlap with this because this is when Antichrist shows up on the scene. And this takes you to the end of the six years of seals. That's the mark when they flee into the wilderness in Mark's discourse, and here they're still in the wilderness until the period of Israel's kings. That's when the Lord comes, <coughs> excuse me, for the mid-trib great multitude rapture. And so I wanted to show you, based on this, what this talks about in the is. So when you understand that Muhammad, I think he was about 40 years old when the whole claim of Muhammad and, and when um, the Muslim... Uh, uh, thing began that we see here it's called the siege of Banu and I'm not going to say I'll just call it the siege of Banu took place here during January of 627 AD and what had happened was Muhammad and the whole Muslim rise began in around 610 AD so this was very shortly after that time as it was all growing as it was all starting to grow and it said listen to what it says during january of 627 and followed on from the battle of trench so what is this period of time this is a prophetic picture 
that we know in the end of days is when Antichrist shows up. You see, we have the time of 600 here. Okay, so this ended this time and this starts this time. But you could even say this could even go to 700. It's just approximate time frames. And what do we know about it? We know that in the is to come, it's not Rome that's going to come persecuting everybody this time in relation to this period of time. It's going to be connected to the Antichrist. And the Antichrist, we have shown and proven he is 100% going to be Arab. He is um, through the Muslim line. It is all about their Mahdi and their prophet. And he came in this period of time, in this tail end right here, which you can even put into the 600s, like I said, because of the approximate timing. Now, listen to what it says. The Banu are a Jewish tribe that once lived in Medina. So what on earth is a Jewish tribe in the 600s doing living in Medina? It said, though allied with the Muslim, with the Muslims, and even lent them equipment to dig the trench during the Battle of Trench, refused to fight in the battle as they were, of, as they were offended by Muhammad's attacks on Jews. See, Muhammad's attacks on Jews. Uh, the Qadi claims that Muhammad had a treaty with the tribe, which was torn apart. Norm Stillman and Watt believe such a treaty was doubtful to the extent that Watt believes the the Banu had agreed not to assist Muhammad's enemies against him. According to this, Peter, these guys here, on the day that the Meccans, right, from Mecca, with uh, Meccans withdrawal, Muhammad led his forces against Banu. According to Muslim tradition, he had been ordered to do so by God. So here we are in the was, and they're in this period of time right here. They're in the, the wilderness wanderings. So this is the, the was, this is the is, but what had happened to the Jews? Well, persecution was happening, right? Where was the persecution? Where did it start from? It began with Rome. So by the time they're in this age right here, having fled as the prophetic picture in the was, having fled in the is to the wilderness, there was a group of Jews tribe of Jews down in Mecca. And who shows up on the scene? Muhammad. Right in the same picture of the time frame in this is period, in the latter portion of it, Muhammad shows up while they're in this period of the wilderness. So we're seeing the same prophetic time frame take place. Now listen to this. The Banu were besieged for 25 days. So the Muhammad, the Muslims end up turning and going against them, believing that God told them, and the Banu were besieged for 25 days until they surrendered. The men from Banu, who were one of the two Arab tribes in Medina, who had become followers of Muhammad and part of the Anzar, requested that Muhammad treat Banu leniently as they, <coughs> excuse me, as they were their client tribe. Muhammad then proposed that one of the men from Banu pass the judgment, and they agreed. He then appointed this person who was gravely wounded by an arrow. So now all of a sudden you've got somebody gravely wounded by an arrow, kind of sounds in this Middish Seals portion that we talk about in Revelation 13. Everything is a fractal, guys. It all plays out in a different way. But similar so one who was gravely wounded by an arrow um so Saad stated that his decision would be the men should be killed the property divided and the women and children taken as slaves muhammad approved of the ruling calling it in accordance with god's decree pronounced above the seventh heaven after that nearly all male members of the tribe who had reached puberty were beheaded. Were beheaded. The Muslim jurist quotes 600 to 900 killed. The Sunni Hadith did not give a number killed, but state that the women and all prepubescent males, uh, pubescent males, were killed according to verses here and here. So 
we're seeing this very, very interesting connection. Why were they there? It, it, in the typology, it's exactly in the time frame. But why were they there? They were fleeing the Roman, the, the Romans. So Jews, the Jewish tribes reportedly arrived here in the wake of Jewish Roman wars. And they might have introduced the the uh, uh, the agriculture, uh, economy, political dominant position. You know, they they fled, they fled there. And when did they flee? There's your Roman persecution time. There's your wanderings. By the time they're established in this part, in the is, which is prophetically revealing the was when they were in the wilderness, is showing you that they were there in this time, having fled to the wilderness in the is, like a picture of the was. And who shows up on the scene? <laughs> it's Muhammad. The Muslim portion is now beginning. And what do they turn to do? When the one has this deadly head wound, they turn on them and they go to start beheading them. Hello. Sound like a replay that's coming? And this was just a microcosm here of a picture that took place in those days. So one of the reasons I wanted to bring it up is not only is the is the prophetic typology from the was connected to the is revealing the is to come for both and how it plays out when the antichrist gets that power but it didn't happen with the muslims or even muslim you know the mahdi with muhammad didn't even happen till about this time frame why is that important? Because it's the Mahdi who's coming in this time frame of the is to come. It's the Muslim Antichrist. And the is of what happened was a prophetic picture of his timing of when he showed up. He literally showed up in this time frame, which is connected to our is to come when the Antichrist shows up. And he has his 42 months until the end of the sixth year of seals. But... Why did they flee in the first place? What had them down there at this period? It was Rome. So a lot of this goes back to, well, what's taking place during the first two and a half years of tribulation? Well, we know this connects the start of the 50 days, the 40 days, and then it's also all the way through seals. So this is covering not only the start of the 50 after the pre-trib and then the 40 days after the wedding, this takes you all the way to the end of the first two and a half years of seals. So what's happening in the is to come during the first two and a half years of seals? We all know what it is. It's World War III. So who's bringing about World War III? Is it the Muslims? Nope. You see, is it, is it Iran and Syria? Is it Iran and Israel that begin? Everything at the pre-trib and the, the attack in northern Israel? Yes. Is it Syria that comes and destroys Jerusalem at, at, the, at the end of 50 days on Feast of Trumpets, I believe, next year? Yes. That is the kickoff that will officially, you could say, quote unquote, officially begin World War III. But it's not Syria and the Arabs that bring it about absolutely everywhere. They don't have all of the weaponry that... Uh, that the West has. So who does the West represent? You could say Rome, right? You could say when East and West broke off. So you've got the Western world, you've got the Eastern world, both of them with nukes, both of them going to war. Just like we know, it's uh, um, the bear, but we have the bear and we also have what? We also have the leopard. So in through Germany, it's, it's this representation of, of the ancient Roman church that is bringing about World War III for which we know is going to last the first about two and a half years of tribulation. So when Jerusalem is attacked, there's year one, there's year two, maybe I'll do it this way. There's year two and a half. And then Antichrist gets his power to continue 42 months to the end excuse me, to the end of the sixth year of seals when the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion. So 
I just thought that was so interesting to be able to see. It, it kind of ties into the, to one of the previous videos that I shared that little bit in relation to um, Chuck Missler and what he was sharing. It, it's, it, I mean, you want to talk about a fractal. This whole time frame here of the first two and a half years is World War III, which is by the bear, which is by the church, by the, the Roman-esque typology of what was, is, is the first two and a half years of seals. It's not until Antichrist comes in that gets his power that it's when the Muslim Mahdi shows up. And prophetically, it was exactly the same thing. And what were they doing? Bang, beheading people. We know that Smyrna are the workers. <clears throat> and what does it say for Smyrna? Right? That they put their necks on the line. Or uh, um, uh, that some of them would die. And we know that Smyrna is connected to Priscilla and Aqu Aquila in Romans 16. And what is it? They put their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles. It's, the, I just thought it was so amazing to be able to see just a, a little glimpse of what happened in history at the timing that Muhammad shows up and the Muslim portion starts. Then there's a deadly head wound. They, they had fled from the time of the Roman persecution because of quote unquote for the is to come World War III. And then it's the time of Mahdi. And he shows up, and there's one that has a head wound, <clears throat> and when he has, or a gravely wounded by an arrow, and in this gravely wound, they decide that they're going to start killing him, and they start beheading him. It's 100% the same prophetic picture from the was, in the is, of course, of what was described, which we reveal in the is to come. I just thought that was, that was wild. I had to share that with you. So... With that, now we're going to go into the next one. I love seeing the was, the is, and the is to come, just laying it all out. That's why with uh, that Chuck Missler one, I was just blown away because with our end time eyes, and we read and we see these things with the end time understanding, I'm not picturing what happened in the what, in the is. I'm, I'm seeing what's happening in the is to come within these pictures. And for those that are new, these things that took like 2,500 years and the last 2,000 years, in the end of days, they're going to play out over 50 days and 14 years. That's it. That's why Mark's discourse, which is connected to this period here, is called worse than it was in all of human history up to that point. And then when you get to this point, when the Messiah gets cut off and it goes into Laodicea again, which is mid-trumpets time, it says that will be worse. It's the Matthew fleeing into the wilderness. This is the Mark fleeing into the wilderness. And it says that this one is going to be worse than the one from Mark's. Why? Because all of this is going to be packed into about 14 years, not for 4,500 years. Craziness, right? We've proven it too. We've shown it all throughout scripture. It just blows me away how wild it is. And I'll say this. Here's another side note. Because a lot of people I've heard come across uh, for two things. And I want to make this clear for everybody. Let me bring this chart up. So in the tribulation, oh, do I want this one? This one. So... Just because it's one seal, one, it doesn't mean one seal, second seal, third seal, fourth seal, fifth seal. It's not one seal per year. It's not one trumpet per year. The first seal, which is the white horse rider, goes out first. He's only here for 40 days, then he's gone. Then the red horse rider begins the 14 years. So what you're going to come to see is from the beginning of the 14 years, after the 50 days, from the beginning of the 14 years to the end of the sixth year is the second seal to the end of the sixth seal. So there's only, what, uh, five seals. You have the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth that will take place over these six years. The seventh one happens later after the great multitude rapture. And the first one happens in the 50 days. So these other five that take place over six years, it's not one and then another and then another. Some will overlap. 
Some will end, another will start. One will go through to the end, take a portion from the other one. It's not just one after the other, one year, one year, one year. Okay, so I want to make that clear with people. <clears throat> the other thing I want to make clear is that you, I've seen a couple of teachings recently and I could see their confusion in it. They've had really good information, but some people would like to tell you that, oh, we're already in the millennial reign. You know, we're in the millennial reign and the tribulation, sure, it hasn't started yet, but it's going to come, but it's part of the millennial reign. No, it 100% isn't. And one of the number one reasons people fall for it is because they begin their counts from the birth of Christ. Just like when people go back to Adam, they begin from the creation, from the forming of Adam. That is not where the fall happened. And that was not where salvation took place. You see, there was no salvation until Christ's death and resurrection. That is where the count starts. There was no fall with Adam when he was formed. It wasn't until Eve and then what took place and then Adam had his portion. That was where the fall took place. And it's believed by some that Adam was probably the same age as Christ about 33, 34 years old. That makes sense. So it would it would have these equivalent portions of time in between. And so that's why you'll hear people that think that, well, it was 2,000 years and then 2,000 years to Christ. And then from Christ until the year about 2,000, that's another 2,000 years. And they say, see, we're already in the millennial reign, the 7,000th years. No, we're not. It's It's the understanding of where it begins. And it didn't begin at Christ's birth. It began at his death and resurrection. All right. So hopefully that will help clarify some things for some people. Now, let's go to this one. This is from Deep Believer. She had us on, I think, about two years ago. And we revealed on her channel the differences in the Gospels. And, of course, you know, as Watchmen, trying to discern the season and time is also part of it. And we had very good reason back then for believing it was in, well, I don't know when it was, 2021 or 2022 that we were on our channel. Because we were counting this understanding to try to discern the 70th year. But if you go and watch it, it was still a great video, especially revealing to a new audience the differences within the Gospels. That was super powerful. But this lady here, you can see her title here, The Most Detailed Testimony of Heaven. It's awesome. I posted it in the forum. I recommend everybody watch it. It's wild. And this happens all the time. When people have a, a, an event where they go to heaven, where they died or they were, they were you know, out you know, in a coma or whatever, and they go to heaven, the evidence of it being true is the transformation in their lives when they return. And I've shared that a few times, and there's a number of videos over the years you know, what is it? Uh, we are overcomers or overcomers channel. I can't remember his name at the moment. He was on deep believer as well. And then he ended up starting his own channel and he had a similar thing happen to him as well. And he was on fire when he came back. So there's been many of them and you see the change in their lives. So this one is wild. I would recommend everybody go back, listen to the whole thing, but I'm going to share some excerpts of it with you. And you're going to notice that it kind of goes in reverse. So it's like this, you know, like I said, a uh, uh, post, mid, pre. So we're going to start with this pre-conversation that she mentions, just in a little blurb that she talks about. And then we're going to take it to the other places because I'm going to use the last two as a lead in into the next. So let's have a listen here. Let's see. My volume is up. I think I have her at 1.5. Oh, I have her at 2. So if you're listening to me already at a faster speed, you're going to want to slow it down. So we'll listen to this for about a minute. I think the rapture's true. I do, because I've asked God and he's given me dreams of it. I've had tons of dreams about that and end times visions and um, uh, tsunamis several times. Um, and so he's he's waiting for God to say, okay, now it's time to take take us up. And then, and then I believe, I think people are not going to like this, but, but I do think that after that point, is when the big revival is going to hit. I think it's after that. Amen. He's just waiting for God's word. And that's why things are getting so serious now. Mm -hmm. they so right off the bat, you see, this is something we've talked about many, many times. And here's another woman that understands it now too, 
that the greatest revival in human history, the great revival that everybody's been talking about for decades, it will not come until after the pre-trib, uh, we call it escape, but the pre-trib rapture of the bride. It will not happen until after. You want to know the, the, the easiest, most simple way to understand it? What age are we living in? Laodicea. We are in the Laodicean age, the time of apostasy. We are not living in the time of a church age where it's filled with revival. So what happens? At the pre-trib, this is now over. When the pre-trib escape happens, we are no longer in the Laodicean age, and Ephesus will start all over again. And what is Ephes Ephesus? The apostolic age, the time of revival. Of course, with the chaos of tens of millions of people having vanished, that will be the beginning of the great multitude rapture after people settle down in the craziness of what's taking place. You see, I was talking with our brother earlier today, as I said, and, you know, I haven't talked about this in a while. One of the biggest issues with the end of days is that when people believe seven years, we know that the church has missed that they have a seven years of seals. I'm not talking for the watchmen who believe in seven years. I'm talking about the overall sleeping church that isn't ready, that isn't diligently seeking. They're not repentant and seeking the Lord, watching and praying. That's the sleeping church. They'll claim Christ, but that's it. And so, and, and it, it's called the world, right? The house of Israel, the Gentiles grafted in, it's called the world. They're going to go through seals and will have their part in the great multitude rapture if they come to Christ. So what happens though, is because the world of church in a seven-year thinking has no idea that it's 14 years, what's going to happen? Well, at about two and a half years in, Who's going to show up? In a seven years, they only believe in seven years of tribulation. So in seven years of seals, when the pre-trib happens and the world of church that had heard about the rapture but never really maybe understood it or believed it, when tens of millions of people go, it's going to be chaos. And the pastors aren't going to know what to do and they're not going to be able to explain it or the church members will be, dis will be upset with them, obviously. And so what are they going to look for? People are going to tell them, hey, they're about to rebuild the city and the streets in Jerusalem in the temple because it was destroyed at the beginning of the 14 years. And we know that there's going to be this decree to go and build it, but we know only the foundation is going to be laid in the midst of seals. Well, what are they going to be waiting for? Well, in a seven-year tribulation that everybody else believes in and thinks is true, we know that in the middish time frame of seals, Antichrist is going to show up on the scene. What are they going to be expecting? The mid-trib rapture. So right at the point that they're expecting a mid-trib great multitude, the rapture to take place, Antichrist shows up. Yikes. You see, this is very, very important material and in, in important understanding to have. This, this is why at this point here, when they're going to flee, which is what we were showing right here. It's this same connection, this same period of time when they flee. Let me bring back the same one. Is, is um, the time when those who were the, the modern day apostles, when those who are the, the disciples of the Lord who were following them during the 40 days, they're going to be waking people up. They're going to be bringing people into this revival. But then they'll also have places where these people will be able to flee from when Antichrist gets his power. Could you imagine if there weren't a group of people? Could you imagine if there was no workers during the time of seals? How would the greatest revival in human history take place when all those who are spirit-filled were taken pre-trip? Yikes, right? But yet at the same time, you know it can't happen now because we're living in the Laodicean age. Amazing. When you see these connections, it's really, really incredible. Let's go to 45. All right. Now let's listen to this portion. It knows it's going to happen at any second. Take us up. And, oh. then, and then I believe, I think 
people are not going to like this, but, but I do think that after that point is when the big revival is. All right. You know, they probably didn't look a whole lot different. They just look perfect. So were there any without wings? Because I know you said some yeah. flew. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like at least that I noticed. I mean, I hate to assume anything. Like I know everything, you know, because I just got a little teeny glimpse. But um, like the angel who was hammering the roof on, he didn't have wings that I saw. Okay, well, let's talk about that yeah. because mm -hmm. you mentioned that you did see, because I asked you prior, I said, did you see houses there? And you said, absolutely. So could you take us to how you even got to see houses, what type of houses they were? How'd you get there? Sure. sure. So uh, this was really cool. This was one of the times I was looking over the gates and I was like, kind of like, what's going on over there? And then um, I could quickly see that it was one angel that was so huge that he literally stretched, he was working on a mansion, one of our mansions, and he was literally stretched all the way across it, nailing gold. I saw the gold nails and they were huge. They were like, I don't even know how long, but just huge. And he would reach all the way over the roof and nail it on. And it was like a two, from what I could see, at least a two or three story house mansion. So did the mansions look like mansions on earth? I mean, were they more grandiose? Did it look like American mansions? Oh, yeah, did it look like European mansions? What kind did it look like? Sure. I think those um, were, from what I've prayed about since, not, um, I think those will be tailored to us, just like everything else, you know? Um, so I always say to my friends, I'll joke around and say, I'll be the one in the Italian villa on the beach. <laughs> you know, I'll be, you know, because I think it'll be completely to what we desire. But um, this one was like, actually just a pretty it was beautiful but it looked almost like a victorian house yeah so i think it is they make them literally for us like when god says your mount mansion is in heaven he means your mansion that was another thing about god that i love is that he is so literal he is he tells it how it is god is so literal and it made me look at revelation a lot the book of revelation a lot differently because i think many of these things will actually happen they're Amen. not just metaphors exactly it seems as if theologians sometimes overreach where you know they think it's like you said, metaphors, or it's mm -hmm. like a mansion, but it's literal. What Jesus said is literal. Oh, yeah. There are many mansions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, very true. Yeah, yeah, because there are very many. There's, I saw tons. I mean, I can even never count. I just remember thinking. So see that? Another little piece of insight. You see, we take the scriptures for their word. And when we go into it now, sure, there's some little, you know, allegories and stuff like that. But when these things are described like this, we know it's for real. He's not, he didn't tell us that, oh, there are mansions in heaven. I go to prepare a place for you. And when you get there, ah, too bad, sucker. You're just going to be floating around on clouds. You see? And then she says, after having had this experience, and this was back, I think, in 2013, she, she started looking at scripture a lot more literal, and especially when it came to the book of Revelation. So when you read the book of Revelation, and you're reading these things that are coming out of the pit at the fifth, at the, at the fifth trumpet, at mid trumpets time yikes so i mean when you when you really take it and and look at it in these things like that and you see satan was cast down to the earth oh my goodness i mean to to comprehend what this is going to look like that's like what you go to zechariah chapter 11 and you see the devastation of these things and them eating them and everything i mean it is insanity just imagine we're picturing it in like, oh, okay, no, it's literal what this is going to be. The, the chaos can, it isn't even fully described in scripture, but she's talking about how these things are much more literal in most cases than what people would believe. They're not just these allegories that a lot of theologians and, and others think about. You know, some people say, well, like a, a, a brother I was talking to today and his pastor said, well, I don't believe that the tribulation is going to take place like that. No. You know, there is no tribulation. You're like, um, then have you read your Bible, Pastor? You know, like, where do these thoughts come from, right? And this is something we've really been able to reveal here in the ministry are these, the, what it's actually saying. And, and within all of the typologies of the events of was and is that help us bring clarity to the is to come. They're not events that didn't happen and, and it happened in a type of way like this that were kind of sort. No, they were all events from the was, events from the is. So if they've already taken place in the was and they've already taken place in the is and they were similar in typologies to each other and we're showing how the is to come is a reflection of what was and what is shall be like Ecclesiastes 1.9, it's going to be like that. But then the scriptures tell us, but a lot worse. But at the same time, a lot more beautiful because it'll be the greatest revival in all of human history. It'll be all of this. The tribulation isn't for, for the, the, the kicks and, and the fun of, of the Lord bringing devastation. No, it's his final bout at salvation for everybody to say, hey, hey, time to wake up. There's no more time. 
Because if it just kept going and kept going and kept going, there'd be nobody left to save. Nobody would care about me anymore. People would just throw everything on the back burner and say, forget it. No, it has to come to an end. And to understand it, you have to understand it wasn't from the birth of Christ. It was from his death and resurrection. And when we understand that and we take these forward, man, does everything open up. So that was another one. And I thought that was really cool because let me show this to new people. Look at this. So this is, this is a, a uh, chart that we call chapters to years. And in the chapters to years, all of these books have been opened where within their chapters, they relate e to events in a, in, a, in a verse or two here and there, some of them th throughout the entire chapter, that relate to an event happening you know, near the beginning, middle, or the end of that year of which these chapters are in. So, for example, you go to the Gospel of, uh, the Gospel of John, and John plays out over 21 chapters. It equals the seventh year of seals. Well, if we go to John chapter 14, look at what John chapter 14 said. Remember I said she mentions a little bit about pre and then great revival. And then, you know, you go back a little bit. And now she's talking about mid great multitude rapture. Well, what does Jesus say in chapter 14 of John, which in this revelation of all of these books of the Bible, revealing pictures of the end of days in the is to come, we see John lines up right here. Chapter 14 is in the seventh year of seals. And what is the seventh year of seals? It's the time of the great multitude rapture. Where does the great multitude rapture go? According to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we see the first group, the pre-trib group, they're, whoops, the pre-trib group, they're going to the third heaven. Where's the great multitude mid-trib group going? They're going to paradise. And when he returns post-trib, it's the promised Jews, they have heaven on earth. You see? So these two, the pre and the mid are the kingdom of God, and the post is their heaven on earth, their millennial reign promise. So in paradise, where did the Lord say he was going to prepare a place for them, right? So we go to John 14, and look at what it says, starting in verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. In chapter 14, just the exact same thing in the prophetic picture of what she saw and these mansions being built. So they've been getting built for a long time, all the way back to when Christ was on the cross. Because remember the one that was on the right side of Christ? Jesus, he, he asked for the forgiveness, and he believed that he was Lord. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Paradise was already started, man. That guy's mansion was already being built. Pretty wild. That is a mid-trib picture of what she saw was taking place there. Now, let's go a little bit further. Let's go to 3425. And in this, listen to what she says. Because if you, when you watch the whole thing, it's pretty wild. Because she describes, this was so interesting, that... It was the Lord God, Father. It was Father God that was talking to her the whole time, not Jesus. Not the Son God, like Jesus, God the Son, okay? Not him. It was the Father speaking the whole time and, and showing her these things. And that was pretty wild. That says a lot to me in relation to um, her being a pre-trib person, okay? But now listen to this. And this is something that we're going to touch on as we get further into these other videos with the, the theologians and so forth and these teachers, because this goes into the, the blood dipped portion. Oh, but, but the other thing I was going to say was how wild it is when she describes how tall they were, you know, like she, she describes the size of God's foot. It, 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 it's wild. You, you've got to watch it. But this is in relation to the lion that's seated beside the, the father. Listen to this. 75 feet yeah mm -hmm. and just like uh god was sitting next to a lion petting a lion that had white fur and the tips um i remember coming back saying they appeared to be drenched in blood and it matched in revelation when jesus comes returns with a white robe with the tips drenched in blood and so um, but he was petting this gigantic lion and god 
You see that? So again, what happens? She sees beside the father, there's this gigantic lion, all in white, she explains, and the tips on the bottom were all drenched in blood of his white fur. She says when he's sitting down, the lion was like 30 feet tall. And again, so what are we looking at here? Now we're looking at post. And, and we know this post, and there's a very specific reason why I'm bringing this up. Because who is the one who is here? See the white horse rider on his head are many crowns. It says, and he was clothed with a vestiture dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. Uh, those that came with him, sharp sword, uh, 19 verse 15. This is, this is the battle that happens in that 14th year of tribulation after the 70 years are over. And it says, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of God, of, of Almighty God. Okay? So what do we see? This is when his vestiture is dipped in blood. Do you know when this is? Let me show it to you. Who is he related to? Is he related to the, the son of Joseph? Right? Messiah ben Joseph? Or is he Messiah ben Judah? Here's your Messiah ben Joseph that we're going to talk about here coming up. And here's your Judah. Why Judah? Well, let's have a look. And again, we're going to cover this even in more detail as we go forward. Look at, this is in relation to Judah, because we know what is he? He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. But when is he coming again as the lion of the tribe of Judah? Well, it's not till he comes at the end as, as the lion. And, and we can prove this. I'll prove it through another place as we go further on towards the end, but you could see it even right here. She sees the description of a white lion sitting beside the father, 30 feet tall, sitting down. He's all white, and the tips of his fur are covered in blood. And what do we know about it? We know it from Revelation 19, like she knew as well. And when we take it to Genesis 49, we know it's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And as we shared in the last one, Genesis 49 is telling you in the last days. In the last days, this is insight for us to have in the last days. And look at what it says in 49 verse 11 in relation to Judah. Binding his, file, his fowl unto a vine, comma, and, meaning separate but added together, and his ass is colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. So when is the lion of the tribe of Judah going to return. You got it. Post-trib. Post-trib. Unequivocally, post-trib. And again, like I said, we're going to go into this and cover this more in this difference with Judah as the lion of the tribe of Judah compared to Messiah ben Joseph. You see, we've understood this and we've shared on this for quite a while in different videos but we're going to get more clarity here in relation to this Messiah ben Joseph because Jesus is both of them, but at different times for different purposes. And just as we know, he's not only one Messiah, he's three, depending who you ask, four in one. You'll see what I'm talking about as we keep going. So we know that at post-trib, when he comes for that battle in that final 14th year, when he comes as lightning, he is coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah, and his fur is the, is the dipped in blood. It's his garment dipped in blood. It's amazing. It's so beautiful to be able to follow these things and to understand and to be able to connect them to Scripture. But now listen to what she says in this next part. And... This is something I've also spoken many times about, and I think just about all of you guys understand it now. But you're going to hear it from another testimony from this woman who was in heaven, who had experienced these things. And you'll understand when you go watch the video, it's, it's incredible. But we've shared on this, and this goes back to just like this here when it comes to 
Why do people get it so confused? It all goes back to it's because of Matthew that when they look at the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they will tell you that Jesus is God the Father. No, he's not. We've proven that many times by going in to the beginning of creation, Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2. We see the Son who is the beginning, the Father who gave it all to him, and then you see the Spirit of God over the waters. We've proven it. We know there are three. And every time we've shared on something like this, everybody who, who has had these heavenly events take place, when they've come back and we see it through what has happened in their lives and their transformation in their lives of the stories and that they go on to tell us, every single one of them says the Father and the Son are there. Every single one of them. You see? But we've been confused. We've been told by the church in many or most churches that father and son are one, that they're actually one being. No, they're not. The father gave authority to the son to go and create it all. That's what happened. Jesus is God who created God, the son who created it all. And it is God, the father who gave him the authority to go and create it all. You see, but do they work in perfect harmony? Yes, there's not one hairline fragment that you could stick in between them because they're in perfect unity. But when you get to heaven, it won't be one being. There's a reason why Jesus, when he says he's seated on the right hand of the Father. So what, he's going to sit on the right hand of himself? Of course not. And that's what you're going to hear here as well. Listen to what she says. And then I was like, that's exactly it. And then um, Jesus, I remember coming back and I couldn't believe it. And you had these beautiful blue eyes. And he did look Middle Eastern. He looked, you know, he had a strong nose and a, um, <clears throat> and, but him and God would sit at the throne and they would always be looking down. And I instinctively knew that it was on earth. So I said, uh, one day I was, when I was sitting there and I, we had our, me and God had our talk about making a mistake. I know everyone's heart. It was around that time. I saw them constantly laughing, looking down. And I said, what are you guys laughing at? <laughs> Just joking with them. And God says, I'm looking down on the ones I love. And then I came back and years later, or within a year or two later, I found out that that's the exact definition of the word beloved, the ones I love. Wow. And so, mm -hmm. wow. Okay. So when you saw them laughing, mm -hmm. um, was it on the throne when they were on the throne yes. or was it outside someplace else? When they were on their thrones. Mm -hmm. they there you go. Do you hear what she said? When they were on their thrones, she saw the father and the son beside them and the father, you got to watch the video. The father must be the one cracking more jokes because she would see Jesus's head go back like he's just busting out and laughing. And it's not malicious, of course. It's an in innocent laughter for the things that they're watching on the earth. And she she talks to the Lord and, and the father says, oh, we spend about 50 percent of the time laughing. But once all of our children are here, then we'll be laughing 100 percent of the time. And it was really, really beautiful to hear some of what she saw. And this was just another critical point I found where she saw them on their thrones. You see, that's a big deal because, again, confirms that they are both there. And it's happened in every single one of these we've ever seen and shared the same thing, the father and the son. She didn't see the father's face, but she could see his feet. Um, she, she could see his hair. Jesus, she saw his face, his hair was shorter, you know, just beautiful, beautiful stuff. And so I wanted to share that one with you guys. It's go and watch it. It's from a deep believer, uh, the most detailed testimony of heaven. I think you guys will really enjoy it. She saw hell briefly as well that traumatized her. Um, but it's really an, an incredible uh, uh, experience. And And when we're able to connect these things scripturally, I just love it. It just it brings more power to it. It brings more authority to it. And, you know, do I believe it? Yes, I absolutely do believe it because I can support it by Scripture. All right. So now now we're going to go into this one. And I want you to hear about this. So this guy does uh, you guys have heard of him. We've shared his videos a couple of times. James Tabor. And, you know, it's crazy. I don't know if. Uh, yeah, they're all gone. I posted a comment on this video. I posted a comment on this video we're going to get to later. And look at this. It has 400 and some comments. And of course, my comment was removed. You know, craziness. 
Happens all the time, brothers and sisters. But we've shared on him before because he goes a lot into um, uh, um, uh, he has a big focus on the scrolls, right? On the temple scrolls that were found in Qumran. And he talks about the community a lot, right? Like those, the ones that we've talked about lately in relation to that community that that was there in the was preparing for the is when Christ was coming. Now, this was of the Essenes community that was preparing. They thought what was coming was the end of days when the two messiahs showed up, right? One is the priest, right? And one is the king. And so when you go a few generations into it, and then John's there and Jesus shows up, these guys start to get excited, and he's talking about that. But we know through reading and going deeper into this and into his studies that there's, and from other writers, that this community was an apocalyptic community. But guess what? It wasn't the end of days. So when they were going from the was into the is when Christ shows up, and John, John the Baptist as well, they were expecting it was the end of days. Remember, some of the disciples and apostles thought the same thing. Ah, oh, Lord, now will you restore Israel? You see, and it wasn't, it wasn't the time. But they were an apocalyptic pre-trip or, or, or pre-Christ from the was going into the is. And just like now, there is a group of people, and I don't mean only us. I mean all the watchmen who are watching and being diligent and seeking and searching, even though they don't know what we know. It doesn't disqualify them, of course. They're a group that generally they're outside of the church. The church isn't covering these things, and they might still go to church, some of them, but a lot of them don't go to physical churches anymore because what they're being fed is, is just the same old. There's no preparation in most churches for preparing with the whole word of God, which includes prophecy. And so that's why so much of the church isn't ready. But those who are watching and praying and diligent, who are also seeking prophecy and understanding his is to come, they're preparing themselves and they're preparing others. We have had a blessing to receive the, this revelation of the open books. And we keep praying that other ministries and other YouTubers and those out there will come and take the time to watch them and to understand what's being revealed here so that we can help prepare more people. But it doesn't disqualifying, disqualify them as being types of Essenes as well. It's a group of people in the is, just like there was a group of people in the was before the is, there's a group of people in the is who are preparing for the is to come. And... If you think that the Essenes all died off just at the time of Christ, you'd be wrong. The generations and generations and generations, they've continued and they've continued and they've continued and they continued. There is this same typology of people now on the earth. And you're, I'm speaking to them. <laughs> you get it? I'm speaking to you guys. We are a prophetic end of days type of Essene group being prepared and watching and helping prepare for the time of the end that's coming. Okay? So this is this is the stuff that he's talking about. Now, what's interesting is what you're going to hear here, and we're going to delve into this a little bit, because it's something that we've spoken about. But I want you to hear what he says in this first minute and a bit. I want to make sure I've got the speed. Because you guys are going to understand this. For those that have been watching for a bit, you're going to understand this. Listen to this. Because remember, it's a group prepared before he arrives. And that when he arrives, something is expected that's going to happen, right? Listen to this. Yes. So I shouldn't say, is it possible? Is it probable to likely that when these two figures appeared on the scene, Jesus of Nazareth baptized, joining the John movement, a descendant of King David, according to our earliest source? I know lots of my colleagues... Lots of scholars will say there's no proof Jesus was Davidic. He never claimed to be the Messiah. Uh, I, I don't agree with that. I think he was Davidic. I think he self-consciously uh, believed that he had been called. He felt like he heard the voice, and he read in the scriptures and found himself and kind of modeled his uh, life from the Psalms, from the prophets, and so forth. But anyway, what would they think, especially if some of them said, wait, our teacher said that we're to wait 
until there come the two messiahs. And then there's a scroll that was found in cave one with the community rule. It's kind of like another fragment of like community rule and then community rule A. And we don't have a B, C, D, but like a fragment of it. And we call it the messianic rule because it's just a piece. But you know what it pictures? It pictures the messianic banquet where the priestly messiah and the Davidic messiah arrive and they call together the whole group. And you get the idea that they're kind of celebrating uh, maybe even the victory and maybe even they're like in the kingdom of God or they're near the kingdom <laughs> of God. I could see how followers of the teachers way, way back, I mean, they're from the stream, could be thinking, oh, finally it's happening. It's finally happening. And, you know, did you hear that? Did you hear that? Talking about a group from that Essene community where there was that teacher, right? That that was teacher of righteousness, but there's still an end of days connection of this people because this apocalyptic group of the was, it wasn't yet the time of the apocalypse. It wasn't till 2000 years more. So there's a group, same type of connection in this time for the time to come. And what were they looking for? In this fragment that was found, when the two messiahs showed up, they end up having a banquet with them. They have a banquet with the Lord. Either like near the kingdom of God, he said, or in the kingdom of God. But there, there's some sort of banquet that takes place. And it was this group from the was going into the is and those generations to the time when Christ showed up. What do you think's happening now? And what do we know about it? What do we share on it? Well, you guys will remember this from Luke 14. Let me go to my favorite e-sword. Luke chapter 14. Right? You guys remember this very well? The wedding feast. This is the Gentile wedding. We know there's no wedding mentioned in Mark because there's no wedding for them. And then there's one in Matthew because there's a post one. The Gentile bride and then the Jewish bride at the end. Pre and post. And we know this one here. This, this right here, this pre-trib wedding here in Luke chapter 14 is for all those going pre-trib. You know, I've said it many times. When you're called, when you get taken pre-trib and you're going to the wedding, don't sit down in the highest room in the third heaven. Sit down in the lowest room. And if you're to be honored, somebody will come and get you, it says, and will bring you to the higher room. If you go to sit in the higher room so you can get the better look, and you're not supposed to be there, it says you're going to be asked to go down to the lower room, and then you're going to be kind of like, oh, man, you're going to, you know, you're going to be humbled. You know what I mean? It is still heaven, but, you know, you're going to be humbled by it. So sit down in the lowest room. I've talked about that many times. But only in Luke's, in Luke chapter 14, after the wedding, which we know is the seven-day wedding at the beginning of 50 days. The pre-trib bride is taken. Seven-day wedding happens, and the Lord will return as the Son of Man, as Jonah was. Jonah was what? A prophet. So there's the Messiah prophet still coming again. You'll see why I'm bringing that up for later. But this is when he's going to return to begin his 40 days. And when he begins his 40 days, he's going to have what? He's going to have a banquet with his community. He's going to have a great banquet. This banquet, you don't find this in Mark either, nor do you find it in Matthew. It's only in Luke. Because this is the prophetic picture of when the Son of Man comes after the seven-day wedding, after the pre-trib, and arrives on the eighth day. Who is he having this feast with? We know it. It is the remnant portion of the bride that was supposed to go. They would have been accounted worthy to go with the pre-trib. But they were chosen to remain to serve the Lord, to follow him during 40 days and then receive the anointing from the Holy Ghost and then work during seals. That's that Smyrna group, right? That group working during the time of seals. Who are they? They're the ones who will take part in the resurrection of the just. We know this is Smyrna. We know those are the ones that are resurrected in Revelation 20 um, at the start of the millennial reign. They're resurrected in that final year at the end of tribulation. They're resurrected to be priests and to reign with Christ for a thousand years. We also know that these disciples are going to be Gentiles, right? We Could there be some Jews within it? Sure. But this was something I was talking with our brother again earlier today. I haven't shared this in a bit. Just like if you go into Acts, you see, 
Acts has 28 chapters. It works 14 and 14. Chapter 15 is after the pre-trib escape and everything has happened. And what we read, starting in verse 7 of 15, of Acts 15, it says, And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that God, uh, uh, that how a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts. See, she, remember she even said that? Because God had told her, look, I know everybody's hearts. That's what counts. So, and God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them, the Gentiles, witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt you, God, to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples? Who are the disciples? The thems, the thems. Who are they? The Gentiles, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Why even as they? Because this is the prophetic picture in this typology of what's taking place of a period of time after the 40 days, after the Son of Man, after this period is gone, the pre-trib has happened. We read here in verse 12, then all of the multitude gave silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had brought among the Gentiles by them by the disciples while they were with them for 40 days. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon, which is from Acts chapter 2, after the 40 days, right? Or the, the Son of Man comes and, you know, is connected to his birth. It's a prophetic picture of the 40 days of the Son of Man. We know that Luke chapter 1, in, those, in, the, in the Luke in order, is connected to the pre-trib and then the eighth day and the 40 days of the Son of Man. We see here that Simeon, that same one, had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles. This is a prophetic picture of God who took out the Gentiles, a people for his name. And he took them from where? The Gentiles. It's the same picture. It's the pre-trib who's gone. So these guys are gone. And this conversation is now about even after the 40th and 50th day where these disciples who had been with the Lord, who are Gentiles, were following him for 40 days, and it took place after God had visited the Gentiles to take out a people for his name. Look at that. To take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David. What does he do at the end of seals? Great multitude rapture, and then what are they going to do? Rebuild the city and the streets and the temple which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. And here's your great multitude rapture, that the residue, right, that the left behind, the left down, that the left behind of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called. So he's telling them the pre-trib happened. These, these disciple Gentiles were following him for 40 days. They saw his miracles and wonders. Don't try to put a burden of other things on them. This, this is what the Lord gave for them. And they're the disciples. Why? Because in this is, we're in the, in the Gentile age. And the Gentile age goes right to the end of seals. This is right to the end of seals is this whole picture that he's giving right here. There's your great multitude rapture at the end of seals. And then he's going to rebuild again the city and the streets and the temple when he comes again. It's, it's awesome. So we're seeing this connection that also is directly related to what we were sharing here in Luke 14 about who this Smyrna type ology is in the end of days. This group who's going to remain behind as his remnant workers. Now, how does this connect to what I was sharing on James Tabor? Well, this group that's left behind, if, if you were a group that was chosen to be left behind, but you didn't know 
that you were going to be chosen to left behind. You were just left behind and the pre-trib happened. And you were diligently seeking the Lord. You were loving. You were you were praying. You were watching. You were spirit-filled. And you were left behind. And you didn't know that you were a worker. You'd panic, wouldn't you? <laughs> I know I would. I would be freaking out. Well, that's why we've got Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 comforts us in this when he says this in verse 35 of Luke 12. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning as you yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when he will return from the wedding. So he's pre-telling this group who is that same Gentile disciple group that he's chosen here right before the pre-trib happens. We've shared on this before. Right before the pre-trib happens, he's going to reveal to this group of people who he has chosen to serve him that he's about to take them to go to the wedding. But when he returns after the seven days on the eighth day, be ready when I come and knock. And what does he say? Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come and will come forth and serve them. This is that group. So what's he doing? He's coming forward and serving them. Just as it said in, in Luke 14, the wedding, so he pre-told them, and now he's taking the group to the wedding, and when he comes back from the wedding, he's having a great banquet with who? Those who are going to put their necks on the line who will take part of the resurrection of the just. So when we're reading that on this scroll fragment, they see that this, this great banquet is taking place, this great meal and feast is taking place with the, the, the two messiahs, the question is, and this is the question I've always had in this, and I still don't have the full answer. Is this the one? Well, let me explain to you something. It might be this one, because is it Jesus who is the two messiahs? You see, because he is Messiah ben David, and as I'm going to show you, he is Messiah ben Joseph. Something about Messiah ben Joseph still has to take place, though. But because he is both, is this justifiable to say that this is that banquet? So this banquet that the was of the Essene watch group who were looking for in, in their, in their ap ap apocalyptic view, when the is was starting, they thought it was the end of days. This didn't actually happen for them which means it's prophetic for a group when the apocalyptic age starts, which means there had to be a, a, a teacher of righteousness and this community group and watchmen in these days who were prepared before it happens. Because for them, they never experienced it because it wasn't the apocalypse yet. So what are we seeing? We're seeing here a meal. but. Is this the one? Or, as he said, when the two messiahs show up, then they had their meal. That's the question now. Is it when the two messiahs show up? Well, to answer this, we would have to go like this to Zechariah chapter 6, which we know, Zechariah 6, there's another one of the chapters to years books. We go to chapter 6, which is a picture of the sixth year of seals, or the end of the sixth year of seals. And, of course, we see in verse 6, And take the silver and gold and make crowns and set it, and set them upon the head of Joshua. Who is Joshua? Yeshua. Right? He's a prophetic picture of Jesus, the son of uh, Josedek, the high priest. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. So there's, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow out of this place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Well, we've shared on this many times. Who's the one who's going to build the temple? Josiah the high priest? No. Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is the one who's going to build the temple. He's the one who laid the foundation 
And we read it in Zechariah 4 that he laid the foundation and he is going to be the one to complete the temple. So you've got Joshua, Yeshua, the high priest and king, and you've got the branch who laid the foundation in the midst of seals. The rest of it didn't get complete. And when the end of seals comes and trumpets begins, the temple is now going to start to get built and it will be built in the first half of trumpets. So it says at the end, this is a picture of the end of six years of seals. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord and he shall bear the glory and shall sit upon it and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. So there's a council of peace between them both. And what does it say? Verse 15. And it says, and they that are far off shall come and build in the temple. Okay, when we go to Zechariah and we go to chapter eight, which is the picture of the beginning of the four, of the seven years of trumpets. Now we see, let your hands be strong. Okay, let your hands be strong in Zechariah eight nine. You that hear in these days the words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the Lord's house was laid. So who laid the foundation? Zerubbabel. He's going to be the one to finish it. And here we have the beginning of the rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple, which means the son of uh, uh, the, the son of man or the Lord, who is the picture of Joshua, who is the high priest and also a king is ruling with the branch who's rebuilding the city and the streets uh, and the temple. And we know that Joshua, the high priest and king, is obviously above the branch. So the question is, is the end of seals, the period of time, or the end of the sixth year of seals, is this actually the period of time that that fragment was talking about? Is there going to be a special meal for that remnant disciple Gentile group of workers? Is there going to be this meal when they show up? And if you remember on another study on this, on, on a writing a guy did about it, it said when the two messiahs show up. So I've often wondered, is it really connected to the to the the Luke 24 and the the Luke chapter 12 right before and then to be ready when they return from the wedding? Is that the banquet that James Tabor is talking about from that from that fragment? Is it the pre? Or is it at the mid? I still don't have a 100% answer, though it seems more probable that it's connected to the mid. But can we show a banquet for the mid-trib remnant workers? I don't know. I could show the one that's pre when he starts his 40 days. But the, the main point of it is whether it's when he starts the, the 40 days on the eighth day, or whether his return on heavenly Mount Zion at the end of the sixth year of seals, it's showing that what this was a scene group and community was expecting in the is did not take place because it wasn't the prophetic end of days, which means there is a group in the end of days prophetically watching and praying with the books opening and the revelation of the, of the, of the prophets the Gospels, all of these things opening in revelation of understanding in a group being prepared who on the fragment said when this happens, connected to the time of the kingdom of God, which is the pre-trib, but it's also the mid-trib, you see? But the point is that it's connected to a group that it hasn't yet happened to because it didn't happen from the was going into the is, which means this group is also prophesied from the is to the is to come. Which means we're probably in some form or fashion descendants from them. And probably some of the other watchmen throughout the world as well. This is pretty wild. You see, it's always great when you can get it from another source. You see, this isn't just all coming from me. These are things discussed in other people's teachings from their deep studies, their decades and decades of study. It's awesome. So let's go a little bit further. 
106. All right, let's have a listen here now. Oh, yes, listen to this. And historically, I'm not sure, but he certainly would be familiar with them. So it depends. If he had the teacher's hymns, you know, like the, let's say he had a copy of the Thanksgiving hymns. I don't know anything in it that he wouldn't love. You know, really, what, what do you, you know, if you haven't read them, you can read them yourself. You don't have to take the course, but what do you read them as we go through them? Uh, in the last Zoom meeting we had, we, we went over, uh, started going through the, the uh, we started going through the Thanksgiving hymns. So it was tremendous. So, uh, but I think he might have considered some of the founding documents of the group as uh, good records of how the movement started, but maybe he wants to shape it in a new way. See that? I thought that was awesome. You see, it's something that we touched on in the past from another writing that we shared. In this community, there were writings, there were, there were teachings within this community and the teacher of righteousness and, and those that were a part of that whole community. And from it, as we've read in, in past ones, that when Jesus showed up, like he's saying here, he would have seen these writings of this Essene community. Remember, Jesus was a Nazarene. These guys were Nazarenes. They were Essenes. Nazarenes are all connected. And so he would have also read of these writings. So having seen these writings, Jesus is what he's saying here, would have seen some of these Psalms writings that these guys had. And Jesus would, of course, agreed and been in line with them because they were righteous writings. But then Jesus takes it and takes it into, you can say, like, on another level. Now now really expounds and goes above and beyond. Well, this is something that we've shared. In, in the previous writing on something else, we've, written, we've watched in relation to a writing on this community. And what are we talking about? We know that this community, through the teacher, is being revealed the revelation of Scripture without the uh, audible of the Lord without dreams and visions, but is given understanding of the apostles of the books and is being revealed. They're under deeper understanding hidden within them to prepare a people for the end of days. And not only him, but all these others that study this have said that when the Lord comes and this group that is the apocalyptic one, the one that will be at the end, when the Lord comes, he will take what they've done and will expound upon it. It's, it's like everything we keep saying. It's a fractal. It repeats, it replays, it repeats, it replays. It's a fractal. But that one is one that they believe they were that time, but they weren't because it wasn't the end of days. There was 2,000 more years to go. Which means... The one who has it in the end is revealing these things, and that community with them is the one that when Christ comes, or not only when Christ comes, but according to what is written, when the two come, you see, when, when the two messiahs come, that he would then take it and expound upon it. Well, what do we talk about with this as well? We have to say, well, at what, which point is it? Because, again, if we go into Luke, and we go into Luke chapter 24, we see where the Lord is going to expand upon it. Where is it? Uh, da, 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 da. No, it's in the 40s. All right, right here. In Luke 24, 44, something we've, we've shared a lot on. And it says, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. All that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms. <laughs> you see, guys, the New Testament wasn't written yet. All of these things that he's talking about here is what we reveal from. The law of Moses, the first five books, done. Right? Of course, there's always more. The prophets, got it. The Psalms, got it. But there's more and more and more detail throughout everything, including the New Testament, where we've revealed even more within these differences and so forth. But we don't know it all, but we've revealed it through revelation of Scripture, not audibles, not thus saith the Lord's, through revelation of Scripture, 
in all of these types of shadows from the beginning of creation to the end of revelation in the was, is, and is to come. And when Jesus comes, and this is a picture in Luke 24 of when he's here for the 40 days on the road to Emmaus for a certain group within the remnant workers, what ends up happening? He expands upon it. He expands upon it. So we're getting the same prophetic picture of what is written in that community and in the writings of the was into the is that we're seeing and we've been talking about for years going from the is into the is to come with the group prepared. And it says, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So you see what happens. We see where there is a banquet that happens in the beginning. There is this understanding. You see when he opens their understanding, remember when he said he was going to have a meal with them and serve them? That's what happens here. That Luke chapter 12, when he when before the he goes to the wedding, he says, when I return, I will sit at meet with you and serve you. This is that group right here. It's the Luke group. It's that group that was chosen to remain from among the bride who he, who he told just before the pre-trib happened. And so there's that same group. And only in Luke do you see where he gives them the understanding of these things that he's expanded upon. You see how wild that is? So we've, we're, we're two for two in things that are happening at the beginning, not at the end of seals. But what the writing said is that when the two of them, whoever the, the, the two messiahs, and what they mean by the two messiahs, one, of course, is Messiah Jesus, and the other one being the anointed one in their day, going from the was to the is, was John the Baptist. So Jesus, in what he's talking about, listen to this carefully. This is all going to tie together. It's awesome. Because what ends up happening is what you heard him talk about there a moment ago is how he believes Jesus was the Davidic Messiah. The Davidic Messiah is through the line through the tribe of Judah. But there's still a Messiah ben Joseph coming. And we've shared on this before. So when he came the first time, and they expected this that to be the time, it was John who was what? Well, John was of the priestly line. So John was the Messiah priestly line. And Jesus was the kingly line through David because he was of the tribe of Judah. You see what's happening? So you had your quote-unquote two messiahs, your two anointed ones. One is king. And one is priest, which was through John, the Baptist. So what do we have coming in the end of days? Is this something that's going to start at the beginning when he comes on, when he warns them at the beginning, and then when he comes on the eighth day at the start? So those 50 days that happened before the 14 years, pre-trib happens, seven-day wedding is taking place in heaven. He returns on the eighth day to begin his 40 days. He has this meal with them. And after the meal, he expounds on them the revelations of things they've already been receiving. He now opens it to them. If this is the case, then where's the other Messiah? You see, because what is there? There's, there's that kingly Davidic Messiah, right? And there's the other one who is the, the high priest Messiah. You see? So... Where are the two of them? If it's in the pre-portion at the beginning after the wedding and not at the end of seals, so far we can see the first two things being before the seals begin when he's here for his 40 days. So then if that's the case, where's the other one? Where, if, if Messiah, when he comes this time, isn't the high priest and king, or, uh, sorry, isn't the, the Davidic king, but he's, the, he's going to be now playing this Joseph role because of the is to come, which we're going to get into as the Messiah ben Joseph, which means he's now going to be the high priest kingly line, uh, the, the high priest line, who is also king, but he's going to be through that high priest line. Then that means the Davidic line has to also be there. And who do we know would be the Davidic line? Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. 
Well, guess what? You guys realize that Zerubbabel is already here, right? Now, I'm not saying who Zerubbabel is with certainty, but what I'm telling you is that Zerubbabel isn't like our Savior Messiah. That is Christ. But Zerubbabel is an anointed one as another Messiah in the Davidic line, and it's Zerubbabel who's laying the foundation in the midst of seals. Do you know that Zerubbabel is here from the beginning because he's already a man here? So is it possible that when Christ comes, let me give you an example. Let's go into Ezra. So in Ezra, the proclamation of Cyrus in the first year, right? So Jerusalem is attacked and destroyed. And who would have to be here? Okay, there, there's going to be this proclamation to allow them to go rebuild. We know they're only going to get the foundation laid. But look what happens. Look who's here, even at the beginning, which came with Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. Because Zerubbabel is a person here on earth right now. We don't know with certainty who he is. But I can assure you, if you're here when the tribulation begins and you see somebody who is allowed to go and head the rebuilding of, of, of Jerusalem or the rebuilding of the temple to, to quell this craziness that is breaking out, and you see this person going to lead it, you will know who the modern-day Zerubbabel is. So my question is, is if Zerubbabel is somebody who is already here, and Messiah is showing up on the eighth day to have a meal with this remnant worker group and to serve them and then to open to them their understanding, is it possible that when he comes for that banquet that the other quote-unquote Messiah Ben David in relation to Zerubbabel who rebuilds is going to be there too? Pretty wild, right? Pretty freaking wild because these two things him serving the meal and that banquet and him opening their understanding because he's going to expound upon the understanding that was revealed and made known through the teacher in the community and both of these things are in the 40-day connection when it starts in luke chapter 24 revealed from luke 14 and revealed from luke chapter 12 and Zerubbabel in the was, we can see, was there from the beginning. And in the prophetic is to come means he's already here if the days are near at hand. And will be revealed when the time comes and the declaration is made. So is it possible that when Christ comes to begin those 40 days and he does this and he has that banquet meal with these guys, that whoever modern day Zerubbabel is will be there with them and that will be where the two messiahs are there with them and have the banquet meal with them. Isn't this amazing? Guys, these are writings from 2,100 years ago found in the Qumran, in the Damascus documents that people have spent decades researching and digging into. We can show the connections to them in the pre-trib, in, in the is, before the is to come, as an apocalyptic time is truly at hand, whereas 2,000 years ago it wasn't, which means that the real group of which it was going to eventually apply to wasn't them, but they were laying the foundation for it because the group at the end would be the one when actual time of the end begins. And we can show it to you right here in the group that we've been saying the whole time is the pre-group connected to Luke 24. And Zerubbabel already being here? Oh, my goodness. It may very well be that that fragment scroll that he was talking about is literally that piece that is um, at the beginning. Let me, let me just go, let me just rewind this just a little bit more again. Copy of the Thanksgiving hymns. I don't know anything in it that he wouldn't love. Oh, yeah, that's what we were saying. So that's where he was just talking about where he would expand upon it. So this is, again, when, when we tried, when I was looking to say, well, 
if we put this in the is to come and they're waiting for the two messiahs, which we see, when are they the two anointed ones? You see my point now? So we're saying that it may be in here when he in the 50 when he comes after the eighth day on the eighth day. But we see in Zechariah that the anointing of these two anointed ones become the anointed ones at the end of the sixth year of seals. So you see why I'm not convinced. It might be one, it might be pre, and there's more evidence that it's in those, that eighth day, there's more evidence to that than there is that it's down here at the end of six years of seals. Because I can't find a meal when he's going to sit with them. Now, can we say, well, at this point, the reason Jesus will then take over, of course, is because he's here, but he doesn't have to expound to them. He doesn't have to expound to this group anymore because now he's here. The Lord is here after six years of seals. I don't know if you guys caught that over all these teachings. We know that he's here at the end of the sixth seal. So he's here during the seventh year. He's here while the rebuilding is taking place in the first three and a half years of trumpets. And then after the three and a half years, he's cut off. There's war that breaks out against him and Zerubbabel. And at the end of 13, and then what happens? He's gone for a short time, and then he returns feet down. So he's here from the end of six years of seals forward in, in one way or another. So it could be that this being the time of them receiving that anointing at the end of the sixth year, when he defeats the enemies and Antichrist is killed before he comes back out of the pit over here, it could be that this is where he takes, as James Tabor was saying, that he takes the understanding from that point, from the community and from the teacher, and now he's going to go forward from there with it. That could be the case. The only thing is, is I don't see a meal, a banquet meal that he ends up having with having with that remnant worker group. But we can see it in the pre. So I again, I just thought that was so cool to be able to see another person talking about this period of time when the two anointed ones, when the two Messiah types are there and the Lord takes it the, the information and the understanding that they had and then now goes on from there. I just thought that was really cool. So now let's go a little bit further. Where am I? 111. All right. Check this out. Just that word until. The law and the prophets were until John. Well, that would mean that once Jesus comes, John and Jesus, finally, we've got a prophet like Moses again. Did you hear that? Right? Well, the Qumran group also talks about a prophet like Moses. And I think they consider their teacher the prophet like Moses. Would they then say, yeah, but he wasn't really it, but our guy is, or would they have ways of explaining him as pioneering the way? You know, I've studied Messianic groups enough to know that you don't always have to diss the person before you. You can you could say something like this, and it happens, so I'm just making this up, but it happens. You could say, well, the teacher in the scrolls was the true prophet like Moses, and he did begin to restore all things idea of restoring all things, putting things back the way they were. But, and God intended to bring the kingdom, but the time was not right in the people. <laughs> How many times have you guys heard me that have been around for a little bit when we explain that John the Baptist is the Moses type? Remember that? John the Baptist is the Moses type, and he's also the Elijah type. We know that Moses, who was responsible for the first strike on the rock in the wilderness, when it was struck twice, one was due because of Moses, one was for Aaron. The one for Aaron still has to be fulfilled. And what happened? Moses takes them into the wilderness. Moses is the one who then brings them out of the wilderness. But what happens? He dies before they can cross over to the promised land. We've explained how that's the picture of seals that they're going to go fleeing into the wilderness at mid-seals, that mid-ish seals when Antichrist shows up and he gets that power to continue for 42 months. It's, the, it's Mark's discourse when they flee. And then 
when the 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 John the Baptist type is there. So who is this Moses John the Baptist type in the is to come? Well, we don't know, but what we're saying is that what we've been showing is that out of these two on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, these two groups, there's there's a prophetic picture of of a Moses John the Baptist type because what happens to John the Baptist? John the Baptist gets beheaded. Well, in the prophetic picture, when does John the Baptist get beheaded? Towards the end of seals. Towards the end of seals. Because what does John the Baptist have to do? He has to restore father to son, mother to daughter, in-law to in-law. And that doesn't happen at the beginning of seals. Because during the first portion of seals, they're all against each other. So if we go to Mark's discourse, it starts in Luke's. And when we go to Mark's discourse, what do we end up seeing? They'll take you up to council and be delivered, uh, published everywhere. Mark 13, verse 12. Now, the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, <clears throat> and the children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. Yikes. And what do we see now? Abomination of desolation, the time when they flee into the wilderness. So when the tribulation begins, even the 40 days, and then into tribulation, we're seeing that it's father against son, mother against daughter. So when you come into this, you're going to see it taking place during the 40 as Luke's discourse. However, it's going to continue into seals. So the prophetic typology of John the Baptist, who is to restore, that hasn't happened yet. In got to remember, in the is to come, it hasn't happened. So what he was saying in part was that the teacher within the community is helping to restore as, as a small typology, not really the, the John Moses, but in a small part because he's restoring. What is he restoring? He's restoring understanding. He's restoring the mystery of what was hidden in the revelations to prepare a people for the end of days. And these people being prepared, we know that John the Baptist, who during seals, we know that this group of people uh, of the church, that it's father against son, mother against daughter. Which means the prophetic John the Baptist must also be here, who is also a Moses type, has to be here in, in whatever fashion, whoever it might be, because they have to be restored. Father to son, mother to daughter, so that when the great multitude rapture happens, they're ready to go. You see? So there is still the is to come Moses, John the Baptist type. And again, this is something we've shown within the Gospels. When you go to Matthew's discourse, you'll notice that in the first half of trumpets, you no longer see father against son, mother against daughter. See, just many will be offended. You'll be hated because of me. Betray one another, but there's no father against son, mother against daughter, because they were restored by the modern day John the Baptist towards the latter portion of the first six years of seals. <laughs> and it started with them first being against each other. And so if John, if Moses is also a John the Baptist type, then that means during this first portion, and when the this portion of when the Antichrist comes and they're to flee in the wilderness from Mark's discourse, who was the one that led them into the wilderness? Moses. Who's the prophetic picture of those who was, who was the one in the wilderness? Preparing the way. John. You see? John. So this group of remnant workers who are Moses, John the Baptist types, they're not only Moses, John the Baptist types. Some of them are also uh, um, uh, Elijah types. Because we know that not only is Moses, uh, is John the Baptist a type of Moses, because at the end, Moses is be uh, um John the Baptist is beheaded and Moses 
never got to take them into the promised land. Who showed up to take them into the promised land? Joshua. Yeshua Joshua shows up to take them over into the promised land. Moses died. John the Baptist was beheaded. But what else do we know about John the Baptist? Well, when we go to Luke uh, to Luke's transfiguration story, we see in Luke's transfiguration that there is no mention. So in the prophetic, this is a prophetic picture of the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man <clears throat> when he comes on the about an eighth day. It's also a prophetic picture of years, but it's also a prophetic picture of days. Because it's coming, it's almost the end of the seven years, which is the start of the eighth year, which for those who are wondering, you see, seven years are almost done in these 50 days. These 50 days are the last 50 days of the seventh year. So it's about an eighth year in the prophetic picture. But it's also the prophetic picture of when he comes after the wedding on the eighth day. Okay, so that's what's going on in Luke and why it's different than Mark and Matthew's. It's prophecy. And what we see here is zero mention of John the Baptist. No mention of John the Baptist and no mention of John the Baptist being a type of Elijah. When we come to Mark and we go to Mark's transfiguration, Mark's transfiguration says after six days, which is the prophetic picture of after six years of seals. When does the Lord come? After the six years of seals. So that's when he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. And what do we see happen now? So this is a prophetic picture of the end of six years of seals. And what does it say? In verse 11, Mark 9, verse 11, listen to what it says. And they asked him saying, why say the scribes that Elijah must come first, must first come? And he answered and told them, Elijah verily cometh first and restoreth all things. You see? So now John is also a type of Elijah. But John was beheaded. Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind. So what are we seeing here? We now see in this prophetic picture of the end of six years, he's saying that John the Baptist, the Elijah Moses, already came and restored all things. And how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. But I say unto you that Elijah is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed as it was written of him. So what do we know? We know that John the Baptist is the Elijah. Well, there are two on the road to Emmaus. One is a Moses John the Baptist type that will die during seals, having restored, but will die before or by the end of the sixth year of seals. And you've got the Elijah type, who is the one who is still alive, who will be part of those taken up in the whirlwind. So some have died, some didn't die. And what do we get in this picture? Exactly what he's talking about. We have this prophetic picture of the is to come where the time of Moses was a representation of what John the Baptist was. And they were from the priestly line and we had Moses as that priestly line. But there's a prophetic picture still in the is to come. And so if this group of remnant workers with this John the Baptist type as Moses are part of the priestly line, which we just saw connected to the disciples earlier, then that means when Christ is coming at the beginning and here during the 40 days, what is he? He's got to be the kingly line, right? The, the Davidic kingly line there. So you, we're, we're, we're starting to get more clarity in this, but we realize that there are still this two Messiah things at play. And we're going to get into this further. But what this really helped with was to show exactly the same types of things that we've been teaching of M Moses and John being the typology directly relating to the end of days as we've been sharing that in their typology, they only go to the end. Of, of the time frame of about the end of the six years of seals. They will not be the ones to take them to the great multitude rapture because in their death, many more were brought about. But the Elijah type will be the ones that will go 
and will take part with the great multitude rapture going in the whirlwind, which is Revelation chapter 7, as these guys are also a part of it as the remnant workers. So it was great to see another person showing this connection from the was into the is, but having no idea of what we know in the revelation of Scripture of how it played out in the is to come. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. It was so exciting. Now, let's see. And what did he say? But it wasn't time. You see that? They were saying, but it, it wasn't yet time. So when they're trying to, to show this in relation to the, the teacher in that community back then, as I've been saying the whole way through, it wasn't time. Not only was it not time from the sense of when the, the teacher had died and it was a few generations and then Christ and John, uh, John show up, but it wasn't yet time because it wasn't the apocalypse time yet. It wasn't yet the end of days like many believed it was when he showed up on the scene because it's still prophetic. So in, in these guys, in, in explaining these things and in all their studies, it's so mind-blowing because they're explaining it like it's already done in most of these cases. Some of them realize it's still to come, but it hasn't yet been fulfilled like some of these prophecies and things that we're talking about in the Gospels. They're prophetic pictures of things that are still in the is to come. All right, next play, next part. I'm going to go to an earlier part to show you guys the connection that will lead us to the next one. Oops. Come on. All right. My heater makes a squeal after a while. So I, when you hear a bang, that's me hitting it. <laughs> All right. Now listen to what he says here. Player. And this is what religions do. They dogmatize, right? And they begin to say, this is it. And in the case of Jesus, finally, you say, well, who's the prophet like Moses, Jesus? Who's the king, the Davidic king, Jesus? Who's the priest, Jesus? Jesus is everything, prophet, priest, king, finally. But in the New Testament. <laughs> okay. Here we just had, as I was saying earlier, the prophet, the king, and the priest, right? Jesus being this fulfillment of all three of them. What do we know about this? Well, let's take it to prophet first. In Luke chapter 11, we know the story of Jonah. He hasn't yet fulfilled the story of Jonah. And when he comes as Jonah, he's coming as what? Prophet, right? He has not fulfilled this story of Jonah. So when he comes to fulfill his 40 days, it said that he would do as Jonah did. Okay? Uh, you seek a sign, and no sign shall be given it, but the sign of Jonah, the prophet. For as Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. When you see this in Scripture, it almost always is talking about the final generation. Jesus did not yet fulfill this. He did not go around after his resurrection warning Jerusalem that they were about to be destroyed. That's not what he did. That didn't happen. And that's why when you go to Mark's story of Jonah, he says he told them nothing and he got in the ship and he left because they will get no sign at the great multitude rapture. They'll see him coming at the end of the six years. They'll see that battle take place of the Ezekiel 39, but they won't know when their rapture's coming. Because they don't go right away, remember? They'll go at about six months or so later, give or take, five to seven months later. So they get no sign. And of course, when you get to Matthew, the three days and after three days and three nights in the belly of the earth, he hasn't fulfilled that yet. And we've talked about that before. There's no way he could fulfill it when he was only about a day and a half in the grave. So we know that these things have not yet been fulfilled. And the contradictions of them are not contradictions, but they are prophecy. They are all about prophecy. So when he comes as the son of man, as Jonah was, what is he coming as? You guessed it. He's coming as prophet. When he comes at the end of seals is what we're going to get into next. Who is he coming as? Is he coming as the Davidic high priest and king? Or is he coming as 
the uh, 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 the the high uh, uh, sorry not as high priest and king is he coming as king through Davidic line or is he coming as high priest through the Joseph line you see that's still the mystery so where where the some people talk about you know there are two messiahs coming and we see that there are the two anointed ones we know that there's still one messiah who is the one who fulfills the Davidic line and the Joseph line in one man, which is Christ. But at the end of seals, there are two anointed ones. One is the Davidic line and one is the Joseph line. But it doesn't mean that the one that is the Davidic line is the Messiah of like Christ, who is also both. Hopefully you're following what I'm saying. You saw how in, in James Tabor, he, he mentioned that. And he spoke about how there's two messiahs that come at some point. We know that scripture mentions the anointing of those two anointed ones, which is going to be the messiah and who is Ben Joseph, you're going to see, which is Jesus, and the other one who is Zerubbabel. Now, Zerubbabel isn't saving anybody, but Zerubbabel is from the Davidic line. In fact, let me show it to you right here. Uh, what is it? Matthew chapter 2, is it? Uh, or is it three or four? Or did I miss it? Is it one? Oh, it is one. Okay, from the son of David. So you go from the son of David and look who you get. That's your Hebrew Zerubbabel. Okay, in the Greek, there he is right there. There's your, your Zerubbabel as a descendant from David. So is Jesus Christ also a descendant of David? Yes, but so is Zerubbabel. So even though Zerubbabel is one of the two anointed ones who are there at the end of seals that does the rebuilding and, and, and was there even during seals during the laying of the foundation, but rebuilds the temple and, and the ruling will be between them both. It is Messiah, Jesus Christ, who is, of course, as high priest and king, is above the Davidic Zerubbabel at the end of seals and into the part of trumpets. Okay, so they are two anointed ones, but Jesus is both the son of David and the son of Joseph. It's wild. It's wild. So it's if for if, if you're newer, this is going to probably sound probably sounds a little confusing to you, but take your time, follow what I'm showing you and understand. And for those that have been around, it should start to bring more clarity. The son of David, Christ comes through the son of David, and Zerubbabel comes through the son of David. Okay? Yet Christ, as high priest and king, when he comes at the end of seals, do you think he's coming as the son of David? Nope. He's coming as Messiah ben Joseph. He's coming as Messiah ben Joseph. So what are we going to see? He just said that he's coming what? That, well, Christ fulfills the prophet, Messiah. He fulfills the, the, uh, um, the high priest line, and he fulfills the king. So he's what? He's pre as prophet. He's mid and into trumpets as high priest. And he's David's line as the line of the tribe of Judah at the end of trumpets. And I'm going to show it all to you as we go forward in this now. It's so beautiful. It is. It's wild, guys. It's so crazy to see it. Like, you can already tell by the look on this guy's face. He's stunned by what this guy is talking to him about, about this Messiah Ben Joseph. And it's something we've shared many times in parts and pieces. Well, we're going to get even more clarity here tonight. All right. Check this out. We're going to start, yeah, 757-ish. All right. Have a listen. The rabbis that are talking about this Messiah, son of Joseph, are actually talking about something that actually is in the Bible, that there really is in the Hebrew Bible, a Messiah, son of Joseph? Yes. In the same way that Jacob foretold a Messiah for the tribe of Judah, mm -hmm. he also foretold a Messiah for the tribe of Joseph. Wow. In the same way that Moses foretold him a Messiah for the, for the Aaronites, and even for Judah to some extent, but much more, Moses emphasized a Messiah for the tribe of Joseph. Wow. He promised a Messiah to three tribes. 
and actually Sa'ad Yagawan himself is going to that scripture that you're alluding to when Moses is... He's going to many scriptures. Mm -hmm. um, he, I don't think he mentions the Deuteronomy scripture, but we can we can look at it. But he, Sa'ad is particularly interested in Zechariah, oh, wow. which we will talk about as well. Zechariah, Zechariah 12. chapter 12. Yeah. So I think if, we, if you don't mind, because you're making a huge claim. Mm -hmm. Again, I've, I've studied the Torah for <laughs> years and, you know, I did my doctorate in Genesis. And I think it would be really good if we could look at Deuteronomy 33, because your claim is that Moses actually, in this passage, predicts the coming of a Messiah from the tribe of the tribe of Ephraim, Joseph, that will come first to die and then be crowned in glory. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Can we look there? So it's Deuteronomy. All right. So right off the bat, you see, I, I love his look. Like he's just like, what are you about to share with me? I want you guys to remember this. He just said that there is going to be one that comes through the line of Joseph, Ephraim, that the rabbis and the ancient writers, the ancient rabbis, knew about so when christ showed up why didn't they all say there he is because when christ came the first time that wasn't messiah ben joseph even though he's all of them that wasn't messiah ben joseph that was messiah ben david it was messiah ben david just like james Tabor was saying no i believe he was from david and he was the 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 priestly line the the kingly line through david and now he's saying that, so you're saying through Messiah, Ben Joseph, and the ancient rabbis knew this, and he's going to come through Ben Joseph. And, and when he does, he's got to die for them. But he hasn't fulfilled Ben Joseph yet. So crazy. 3317. Now, I should just add that this isn't the earliest passage in the Bible about Messiah, Ben Yosef. The earliest would be Genesis 49, 24, mm -hmm. but I think this one is clearer still. Wow. So let's turn to Deuteronomy 3317. And this is an important text because it's the one, probably the text the rabbis cite most often as the source of their belief in Messiah, Ben Yosef. Mm. And Moses is... You see that? That the rabbis themselves quote most often for a Messiah, Ben Joseph. So are, the Jews are waiting for a Messiah, Ben Joseph prophesying about Joseph and his tribes. And he says, his firstborn ox is his glory and the horns of our aim are his horns. Mm -hmm. And with them, he shall thrust the nations, all of them to the ends of the earth. Now, many translations miss this, but this translation talks about two different kinds of oxen. Let me make it clear again. His firstborn ox is his glory and the horns of an Alrox are his horns. An Alrox. Yeah. Yeah, the horse shoro hadarlo, the karne re'em Yeah, re'em in Hebrew, yeah. These are two different kinds of oxen, the shor and the re'em. And they are totally different. The shor is the domestic ox, Bos Taurus. It's a servile animal. It fulfills the needs of mankind. It bears burdens. It pulls loads. It yields milk. And it gives up its flesh and its hide for beef and for leather. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Lordy, lordy. You ready for this? Watch this. He said in Deuteronomy. Now, I hadn't seen this one. I don't. Well, maybe I did. I don't know if I've ever shared on it, but I had it highlighted. We'll also talk on the one from Genesis 49 that he's talking about. But let me show you what he's talking about in Deuteronomy 33. In Deuteronomy 33, we see right here <clears throat> about Joseph. So let's start in, jo uh, in Deuteronomy 33, 13. And of Joseph, he said, blessed of the Lord is his land for the precious things of heaven, for the dew and for the deep that couches beneath and for the precious fruit brought forth by the sun and for the precious things brought forth by the moon and for the chief things and the ancient mountain of the ancient mountains and the precious things of the lasting hills here it comes and for the precious things of the earth and for the fullness thereof i want you to recognize something what do we know is the fullness thereof it's the end of seals, right? At the time, at the end of seals, and then when the great multitude rapture comes, it's the fullness of the Gentiles, right? It's the fullness of the Gentiles. So we have a prophetic picture already in that wording when he comes at the end of the sixth year and the great multitude rapture is coming and it's the fullness of the Gentiles, okay? So we have this fullness taken care of, but what else do you see? Where are we, brothers and sisters? We're coming to the end of Deuteronomy. Do you know what happens at the end of Deuteronomy? Moses dies. What happens at the end of Deuteronomy? 
Have you been following what I'm saying? What happens at the end in the prophetic picture of John the Baptist as the Moses type? He dies. So we're in this time frame at the end of the six years of seals, right before Joshua, who comes next, takes them over into the promised land, who is the prophetic picture of Joshua. All right? So here we are in the prophetic picture of the end of seals and the great multitude rapture coming, and then trumpet's going to start. Listen to what it says. Listen to what it says. Verse 16, okay, to the fullness thereof, and for the goodwill of him that dwelt in the bush, let the blessing come upon the head of Joshua, of, of Joseph, and upon the head of him that was separated from his brethren. Now listen to this. His glory is like the firstling of the lamb? Nope, of the bullock. And his horns like the horns of unicorns. That's another type of bull that he would talk about. <coughs> With them, he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. So what do we see in here? Who is it? We know that his firstborn is Ephraim through Joseph. We've even proven this before. We can show it here in Jeremiah. In fact, I'll get to that in a moment. <clears throat> so what are we seeing here? We're seeing this prophetic picture that we've taught on in the past, where the end of Deuteronomy is the prophetic picture of the end of seals when Moses, John the Baptist type, is dead, and Joshua shows up to take them into the promised land, to take the great multitude rapture to paradise in the seventh year of seals. And when he does it, he is Joshua, the high priest and king, as we just saw back in Zechariah. Where did we see it in Zechariah? In the exact prophetic year of the sixth year being towards the end of it. The exact same timing. And who are we looking for when he's coming as high priest and king? Joshua, Yeshua. Okay, Joshua, Yeshua. What do we know? about the Messiah as a Messiah ben Joseph under Ephraim. They'll, they'll say even you could call him Messiah ben Joseph or Messiah ben Ephraim. What do we know about him? We know that it hasn't been fulfilled yet, but I could never figure out was it Messiah ben Joseph or was it through Messiah ben David? Because what hasn't been fulfilled yet was what? The sacrificial ox, the sacrificial bull. Hello, you guys know what I'm talking about? Let's go to Leviticus chapter 1. In Leviticus chapter 1, we have what? The burnt offering for the atonement of the priestly line of the bullock. And when he came, he was what? The firstling of the sheep. And when he was born, it was two turtle doves. So what do we have? The last being first, the first being last. So when Christ came at his birth, like we shared before, two turtle doves were sacrificed for his birth. At Christ's death and resurrection, what was he? He was the lamb without blemish. What has still yet to be fulfilled? The bullock. The bullock is for the atonement of the priestly line, the Levitical or priestly line, right? So... This hasn't yet been fulfilled yet, and we've taught about this. We've got this in our video again. We can now see where this bullock line is from. Because in Deuteronomy 33, because of this guy's teaching, we know that the bullock is connected to Messiah ben Joseph. Messiah ben Joseph. And it'll be at the time when the fullness thereof comes, and when he comes, which we know is at the end of seals, he's coming as Messiah ben Joseph. <laughs> and he is coming as the ox. He's here during trumpets, as I was saying, right? So now after the great multitude rapture, seals come to an end. The city and the streets and the temple get rebuilt. And Messiah is there as the high priest and King Joshua. And when he's there as the high priest and King Joshua, Yeshua, then when the pit is opened at mid-trumpets, the war breaks out for two and a half years against the two anointed ones. 
And what happens at the end? The two witnesses are killed. What did it say would happen? It said that he would push them together to the ends of the earth. What's the end of 13 years? It's the end of tribulation. It's the end of the 70 years of Jerusalem. It's 2036, 2037. The end of the 70, like Jeremiah 25. And what is the final 7th, 14th year? It is the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance, after having pushed all of them to the edge of the earth. What ends up happening? They will all come to destruction now who came against them. What was he? He became the bull sacrifice that hadn't yet been atoned for. This is something that that guy in, in all of his teachings, he hasn't understood because he's showing that, yes, Jesus is Messiah ben Ephraim. But he's also Messiah ben David. Well, if he's both of them and there was still another sacrifice... You see, they haven't been able to put two and two together yet because it's impossible to do it in a seven-year revelation or in a seven-year tribulation, not in the truth of the 14 years. These things open up and become visible. They Everything starts to open from beginning to end. And so who does he come as? He is Messiah ben Joseph, and he's through the tribe of Ephraim. Well, guess what? You guys will remember this. Jeremiah chapter 31. We've shared on this a number of times. What happens in Jeremiah 31? We get the exact same wording. Listen to this. In Jeremiah 31, starting in verse 2, Thus saith the Lord, the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness. You see, this is the mid-trib, mid-mark, when they went into the wilderness. Even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest, and now what is he going to do? Now he's about to bring them back. Jeremiah 31, 6. For there shall be a day that the watchman upon the Mount of Ephraim shall cry, Arise ye, and let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. Because at the end of the sixth year of seals, they've seen heavenly Mount Zion come, but they don't yet know to go. They don't know when they're going. Remember, there was no Jonah sign given to them. But they've seen heavenly Mount Zion come, like we read at the end of the sixth seal. Then it says, continuing in, in verse 7, For thus saith the Lord God, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations, publish ye, publish ye praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant, the remaining survivors, save the remnant of Israel. Now listen to this. <clears throat> Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth and uh, and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travails with child. Together, a great multitude shall return thither. You see this great? It's great company. It also means great multitude. And if you guys remember this, if you've been around for a little bit, do you know that this is the great multitude rapture that happens at Passover? Remember the, the spring wheat that actually happens at Passover in the midst of the seventh year of seals? Because tribulation goes from trumpets to trumpets, feast to trumpets to feast to trumpets. And so in the seventh year, it starts the end of six, and then the seventh year starts at the feast of trumpets. That is the time when the winter or when the spring wheat is gathered in, uh, it is sorry, is ready, but it cannot be used or observed until the second day of Passover the following year. That is how spring wheat is observed. It's called the younger, whereas Leah was the older who could be used right away and was taken out first. When you go into, for those that have been around, you guys know this, if you go into the original Septuagint, which was the original translation, you will see that it doesn't just say travail together at the great multitude returning thither, it also says at Passover. It literally says at Passover. And why is this important? Well, look at what it says. Verse 9. They shall come with weeping and with supplications. I will lead them. I will cause them to walk. So who's leading them? 
the Messiah, right? The Lord is going to lead them because he has come at the end of the sixth year of seals. So now he's leading them. But who is he leading them as? <laughs> I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. So who is he coming as? He's coming as Messiah ben Joseph. He's coming as the ox that we know is going to be sacrificed in trumpets time. He's coming as Messiah ben Joseph, who is Ephraim as his firstborn. And here he is bringing them in, in the seventh year at the 2031. So if it all begins 2024, then at the feast of Passover on day two of unleavened bread in 2031, the great multitude rapture will come in. Now, they were ready at the end of seals, right? The Lord had restored them all. John the Baptist, the Moses died. And now Joshua, Yeshua, is the one who is what? Well, wait a second. Joshua, Yeshua, he's not Ephraim, is he? That would mean that Joshua... And the prophetic picture that we're seeing in Zechariah, in Jeremiah, in all these places, in Genesis, that would mean that Joshua is through Ephraim, is, is from the tribe of Joseph. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Check this out. Moses and Aaron, for example, were identified fourth generation in Jacob, Levi. While Joshua, a contemporary of Moses and Aaron, was declared to be 12th generation descendant of Joseph. So the one who takes them over into the promised land, he is what? <clears throat> this is so crazy. He's not from the priestly line. He's not from the Levitical line. He is from Aaron's line. Uh, he's from Joseph's line. Yet, he is called high priest and king. So Joshua ends up becoming high priest, yet he is not from the line of Moses and Aaron. He is from the Joseph line. How is that possible? Check this out. I told you guys, this gets so populated with Scripture, so revealing with Scripture because we had understood so much, but there were pieces that were still there. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 7. Listen to this. This is all, of course, now the Melchizedek time. Look, Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 in the chapters to years. Look at this. The book of Hebrews is another one. And where's chapter 7 fall in? The seventh year of seals. So this is the time when the Lord comes. And guess what happens when he comes? He's going to fulfill the Melchizedek. Because he's coming as what? Melchizedek, high priest and king. <clears throat> well, listen to this. Part way through, ver uh, let's start in verse 11. If therefore perfection were made by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? You see, so, so if the law was enough to save everybody, we everything would be fine we wouldn't need we wouldn't need another priest to come after the order of melchizedek it could have just remained under the order of aaron but of course that wasn't enough so it says for the priesthood being changed there is made of necessity a change also of the law for he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe what? For he of whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe. Meaning not the Aaron, Moses, Levitical line. Of which no man gave attendance at the altar. Who was at the altar? Aaron. Aaron and his sons, that, that Levitical line. There was another tribe, though, for which wasn't mentioned at the altar. For Now listen to this. So you can see that there's this other one who's not of the Levitical line. 
Well, who's not of the Levitical line? Joshua through Joseph. <laughs> and then it says, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. So what is this telling us? When he came the first time, he was the Messiah ben, uh, ben David through Judah. Of which tribe Joseph spake nothing concerning the priesthood. Verse 15. And yet it is evident, and yet it is far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. That there arises another priest. So if Christ came the first time as Judah, and yet there is far more evidence that there after the similitude of Melchizedek, there's another priest, but the priest can't be under the Aaron line because there was no mention of this other tribe that wasn't the Aaron line. Who the heck is it? Messiah ben Joseph. And Joshua is from the line of Joseph, brothers and sisters. Messiah ben Joseph. And who is Messiah ben Joseph all connected to? The ox. The ox. So he's coming as high priest and king with another one who will be king with him and share it. But the priestly line is higher because he is the Melchizedek high priest and king from another tribe due to the change of the law because the, 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 the laws weren't sufficient. So he is coming as the Joseph high priest king who is the Joshua type and is the ox that has not yet been fulfilled. And when he comes at it, he's coming at the end of seals, <laughs> which is why we see it mentioned at the end of seals in the prophetic picture of Deuteronomy and Moses is now dead, like the picture of John the Baptist at the end of seals. And then what happens? Joshua Yeshua shows up and he is the one to take them over into the promised land. And who is he? He is Joshua, high priest and king. He is the same prophetic picture of Zechariah chapter six at the end of seals when Joshua is the high priest and king, who is the prophetic picture of the Melchizedek, high priest and king, who is to come. We've solved the riddle, guys. Which one was it? Well, we still have more. It gets better. Because you'll remember this <clears throat> in, um, in Jeremiah when we were sharing this. We know that this year time frame is what we shared. This right here would be the time frame of when they would be received into paradise. If this is according to the Hebrew calendar count, it would be April 9th of 2031. But remember, the Lord is coming on the day and hour no one knows. Remember, the end of Mark's discourse is also a day and hour no one knows. Because at the end of six years of seals, he's coming on the day and hour no one knows in 2030. This is the time. Every time in the period of around fall, when the spring wheat harvest is coming to an end, this is when the, the spring wheat will be, will be ready. But as we know, it cannot be used until the following year on the second day of Passover. This is why Deuteronomy is such a mind-blowing big deal and why when I've shared it with you guys in the past, I was saying I'm as confident about this as I am about the revelation of the Gospels, as I am about the revelation of the 14 years. Deuteronomy is the answer to the mystery that people have had over the years of 717. It's the seven days of unleavened bread called the bread of affliction, which is a picture of seven days of, of unleavened bread as the seven years of seals. How does it play out, though? Six days. And then the seventh day is the solemn assembly. So it's six years of seals. And in the seventh year of seals 
is the great multitude rapture, is the assembly to the Lord. But what comes first? Feast of Weeks. Feast of Weeks is the one-day event. And this one-day event is the pre-trib. It happens first. It goes one, seven, seven. That's the way it plays out. Like Christ on the cross. He was the middle. And then it was the one on his right that goes to paradise. And then it was the other one on his left. And so you have the pre-trib feast of weeks at the true feast of weeks is where the pre-trib will happen. And then you have your seven years of seals, which is going to be six. And then the seventh solemn assembly, great multitude rapture. And then you've got your seven years of trumpets <clears throat> as the seven days of feast of tabernacles. And how does it play out? It is seven full days. And then the eighth day, which is called Shmini Aretz, is the new beginning. And that is going to be the Jubilee, the 15th year, the Jubilee and the beginning of the millennial reign. It's the exact picture in the years that we've been showing. There's your seven years of seals. It's to the end of six. Then you have the seventh year, which is the assembly of, of the solemn assembly in unleavened bread, because that's when the great multitude rapture goes. Uh, will will be will be received into uh, paradise. Then you've got a full seven years of trumpets. Now it's after six, and then the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. But it's no assembly yet, because what happens is the year of the Lord, right? The day the day of the Lord, which is the year of His wrath. This is when He brings the the great wine press, gathers all the nations, and destroys them. It's the year of the as it was in the days of Noah from Matthew 24. And when that's all over, this seven days as seven years of tabernacles, then you have the eighth day, which is the new beginning and the Jubilee. You see the picture? It's phenomenal. And here we see that it's Messiah Ben Joseph, that he's coming as Joshua high priest, who is from the line of Joseph which means he still is about to fulfill the time of Messiah ben Joseph because Messiah ben Joseph is the ox. Let's keep going. 1923. Watch this. He says some crazy things. I was just, I was bent over and I, I mean, just like splitting a gut. I was so excited. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Habakkuk uh, chapter 3, he's prophesying around the time of the Babylonian rise to power, the, the end of the 7th century BC, just before they invade Jerusalem. And he's terrified and frightened at this impending Babylonian invasion. And he looks to the past. And he says in chapter 3, verses 11 to 13, he says, The sun and moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped. At the flash of your glittering spear, you marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your Mashiach, your Messiah. Mm -hmm. Anointed in Your Mashiach. anointed one. And he looks to the past when the Lord God made the sun and moon stand still to deliver his people and save his anointed Messiah, which Mashiach, which Messiah, which anointed one is Habakkuk talking about? Mm. Who is this? It can only be the one for whom the sun and the moon stood still. For whom did the sun and the moon stand still? Only for Joshua when he fought the Amorites in Joshua chapter 10. So Habakkuk is calling Joshua the Messiah. And the Greek translation, what we call the Sexta translation, makes this absolutely clear for anybody who missed the reference. You went out to save your people by Joshua, your Messiah. Mm. And therefore, Habakkuk sees the former deliverance. He sees Joshua as a picture, as a type of the Messiah. And he is looking for another deliverance to come. Namely, he longs for another Joshua Messiah, a Josephite prince from the tribe of Joseph in Ephraim, to do to the Babylonians what Joshua did to the Amorites. He is looking for a Joshua Messiah. Mm. Oh, man. I told you this is incredible. It is so mind blowing. This is what he's talking about <clears throat> in Habakkuk chapter three, when the sun and the moon stood still. And Habakkuk is talking about this. He is he's reflecting on what took place in 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 many years before him, and this reference is directly related to Joshua chapter ten. Well, hello, where are we? If Deuteronomy 
and going to the end of Deuteronomy is the end of seals and Moses is killed and he's the John the Baptist type <clears throat> and the great multitude rapture comes in through Ephraim, <laughs> through the, the tribe, the, the, the Messiah Ben Joseph. And we see it come in. Now we're in the book of Joshua. The Joshua high priest and king. Trumpets is now taking place. They, he's brought them into the promised land and trumpets is taking place. Now what are we seeing in chapter 10? We're in the midst of trumpets. And he's talking about what? He's talking about, right? Uh, where is it? Where is it? Let me see. He's talking about, uh, there it is, verse 12. He's talking about this right here from 11 and 12. Casting down great stones from heaven. Let's start in 11. Joshua 10, verse 11. And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down to Bethron, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven <laughs> upon them uh, unto Azrak. And as they died, and there were more which died with hailstones. Then who do you do you hear of stones being thrown and hailstones in the time of trumpets? <laughs> of course you do. And so here's what he's referring to here in uh, like verse 13, Joshua 10, verse 13. And the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves of their enemies. As it is written, is it not written in the book of Jasher? So what are we seeing here? <laughs> Excuse me. We're seeing this conversation in habakkuk 3 about a messiah ben joseph who is a prophetic picture of joshua who is the ox sacrifice who has not yet been fulfilled giving us this exact same prophetic picture it is continuously building upon this prophetic picture that we've been talking about with joshua and being the descendant and high priest and king, who is the prophetic Melchizedek from another tribe that is still yet to be fulfilled, who is Joseph. Joseph. Man. See, this stuff is in places I didn't even know it was. Where are we? 2130. 2409. He's going to talk about the patriarchs now. Listen to this. Let's start with rabbinic literature. In Pesikta Rabati 37, the Avot HaUmah, the patriarchs, they say to Messiah Ben Ephraim, they say, Ephraim, Mashiach Tzidkenu, Ephraim, a righteous Messiah, although we are your ancestors, yet you are greater than we are. For you bore sins on our behalf and awful sufferings by means of which the earliest and latest generations are atoned for. Wow. Among the peoples of the earth, you became a derision and a scorn for Israel's sake. You sat in darkness and gloom. Your eyes saw no light. Your skin cleaved to your bones and your body was as dry as wood. And your eyes were darkened from fasting and your strength was dried up like a pot shared. And all this happened because of the iniquities of our children. Wow. So, and when you say son of Ephraim, Messiah son of Ephraim, that means Messiah son of Joseph. Of it's course. a different name. It's Why this... Ephraim? Well, because Ephraim was the son of Joseph. Exactly. So we can call him Messiah son of Joseph. We can call him Messiah son of Ephraim. Prime, we can call him the second Joshua because like Joseph's son Joshua he is an, just like the Messiah is a greater David so the Messiah from Joseph is a greater Joshua. And Joshua is also a descendant of, of Joseph. Joseph of course. We so I, wait a minute hold on a second so <laughs> see this this guy is like his mind is exploding and I love it <clears throat> if if these people would you know I, I try to reach out to these people and man man you just want to pull out your hair because you're like, I can we we can help you complete the story. It's incredible. It's it's so what is this showing? Well, if you remember what I was saying, when we go back to the intro, and it's all because of Matthew, this is what we're seeing. You see, if if the church, if the world had realized that it was 14 years and not seven, what they're seeing in the seven is they're expecting the temple is going to be rebuilt. There's going to be a declaration after an attack. They're going to rebuild the temple. And then they think after the Antichrist rebuilds the temple, then the Antichrist will declare himself God when he steps in it after he's completed building it. And they've completely missed it. So what ends up happening is they believe that the Jews, most of Christians who follow prophecy, believe that it's Antichrist who's going to build the, the temple. And not Zerubbabel, who is one of the anointed ones with the son of, with the, the Lord there as high priest and king. And then 
yes, it is Antichrist coming up from, from the, the pit and Satan having been cast down that now he's going to declare himself. But it's not Antichrist who builds it. Who is it who builds it? It's Zerubbabel, and who's there as well? The high priest and king, Joshua Yeshua, who is of the line of Joseph. And what are these ancient rabbinic teachings, and what are the ancient patriarchs, what did they write about it? They understand that a Messiah ben Joseph is coming. Do you know why this is important? Because when Christ came the first time, they didn't recognize him, and they weren't allowed to recognize him for our sakes. And so when he comes, you see, it's the seven years of seals where they're removed from the land. Only a small group will come back because of the rebuilding of the foundation. But all the rest are going to be scattered while the land rests for seven years. And what happens at the end of six and taking place in the seventh? Their Messiah, Ben Joseph, who comes to destroy their enemies. Did you get that? This is what he was saying. This is what he had just said. He was reading it because what's happening is in Habakkuk chapter 3, when he's crying out for the Lord to come and get the victory over their enemies, he's crying out to the Messiah ben Joseph to, to defeat their enemies. What do we know in relation to the Jews? What are they waiting for at the end of seals? They're waiting for their Messiah to show up who's going to defeat the enemies, which is the Ezekiel 39 war, which takes place at the end of the sixth year. And when he defeats their enemies, they will be gathered back into Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the third temple will take place. The physical temple will take place. That will be built upon the foundation that was laid during seals. Which is why in Zechariah chapter 8, which is the first year of the seven years of trumpets, you now see, let your hands be strong, and the temple is going to be rebuilt on the foundation that was laid in the midst of seals. What are the Jews looking for? The Jews are looking for their Messiah, who, are, who is going to defeat their enemies and rebuild the third temple. They are looking for the two anointed ones, one who is a Messiah ben David, but not the Messiah ben David, and the other one who is the Messiah ben Joseph, who is going to be their high priest and king. The Messiah ben Joseph is the ox that we can now understand, which is the sacrifice that hasn't yet happened. And it won't happen until the pit is open. The two and a half years break off, break out against the two anointed ones, the two witnesses. And when the two witnesses are killed at the end of the sixth year of trumpets, the sacrificial ox of Messiah ben Joseph will have been atoned for just as Leviticus chapter one tells us. Watch this. Let's keep going. 2750. You've given us rabbinic sources that at least they were written after the time that the New Testament was written. Are there any second temple Jewish sources that actually confirm that or pre-Christian sources that actually confirm that this idea of a Messiah son of Joseph is is is, is pre-Christian, that, that Jews believe this before Jesus came? Sure, let's just go back to the Bible. Rabbi Dosa and his friends are talking about Zechariah 12. Let's look at Zechariah 12. What we see in Zechariah is that this, this shepherd king who is pierced through in chapter 12, verse 10, mm -hmm. and then he dies. And then those who pierced him through mourn for him and repent of his death. And then immediately afterwards in chapter 13, a fountain is opened for the house of David and the inhabitant of Jerusalem to cleanse them of guilt. And when they are absolved and cleansed by the cleansing waters, evil is undone. They are washed clean. His death has atoned for their sins. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 33, 17. Yes. If the Messiah promised to Joseph is a firstborn shaw, a firstborn ox, he is destined to die as a sacrifice. The firstborn of an ox you shall not redeem. They are holy, sprinkle their blood upon the altar. The son of Joseph is a firstborn ox, so it follows naturally that this son of Joseph, this Messiah ben Yosef, promised in Deuteronomy 33, is destined to die as a sacrifice. Mm. If we go back before rabbinic literature, we've got are this. You, are you hearing this? Yet at the same time, he believes 
that it's the Messiah who already fulfilled his death and resurrection when he came the first time. Yet he keeps telling us it's an ox. A lamb is not an ox. He is yet to fulfill it. It's a remarkable text. Uh, well, I'm from the Dead Sea text, the Dead Sea Scrolls, called the Joseph Apocryphon, 4Q372. It's actually a Samaritan text. It was discovered in the, in the remains of the Samaritan Temple. This is before the time of Jesus? This is at least 200 years before the time of Jesus and possibly more, perhaps up to 300 years before. And you're saying that this is a, a document that actually talks about a Messiah son of Joseph? No, it talks about a figure called Joseph, and he is dying. He is in his death throes, and he, cried, uh, he is dying at the hands of some, some attack against him. We don't know what it is, it's not said, but he is dying and he cries out to God to deliver him. And then he says, I will arise again to do righteousness and to do the will of God. <laughs> Where was this found? This was found in the those scrolls, right? In the in the in those Essene scrolls, right? Those temple scrolls that were, those uh, Qumran scrolls that were found. That a, a Joseph type figure would be sacrificed. He would cry out to the Lord and then he would return again and in the will of the Father and everything else. Guys, do you understand? He keeps saying it's the ox. It hasn't been fulfilled. And what he ends up going to is he ends up going to Zechariah chapter 12. Now, let me show you this in Zechariah chapter 12 because it is awesome. Well, awesome in, in, a, in a sense. You see, in Zechariah 12, Jesus, it's talking here about Jesus who is going to be pierced and die, okay? And they shall look upon him who they have pierced, and they shall mourn him as one mourns for his only son uh, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Harmagin in the valley of Megiddo. Now, let me ask you this. If... Messiah ben Joseph hasn't been fulfilled, and he's showing this as the Messiah ben Joseph to be fulfilled. Do you think we've talked about this word pierced before as well? Remember, this is a strike. For a lot of people that don't know it, in Numbers chapter 20 is where this incident takes place. In Numbers chapter 20, God tells Moses to speak to the rock. And instead of speaking it, it says, and Moses took the rod before him, uh, before the, from before the Lord, as he had commanded. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. This is a prophetic picture of Christ. And he said unto them, hear now, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? That's not what God told them to do. They're trying to claim themselves. Oh, we've got to get the water from this rock. And then what happens? Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod, he smote the rock twice. One was the portion for Moses, which was what already happened in Christ's death and resurrection. For the line, which is the John, the Baptist, Moses, that's the seals group. That's the Mark group. That's the, the world, the house of Israel, the, the lost sheep of the house of Israel that he was coming to save. That's already taken place. He's now just got to come and rescue the rest of them to the end of seals. The second strike relates to Aaron and this priestly line that has to be fulfilled, but it has to be a greater line than Aaron was because the law wasn't sufficient. It's the reason for the second strike on the rock. It's the reason for the second strike. And so what we're seeing in Zechariah chapter 12 is when people go to this, they point to it and they say, see, that when, when they're going to see the one that they pierced and they're all going to mourn in that day. Well, let me ask you, if Christ was two, well, Christ was 2000 years ago. If Christ suddenly shows up again and it's the end of tribulation, pray tell, why would they but all be crying and mourning looking upon the one who they've pierced. They would have no idea it was him. How would anybody have any clue that it was the one who they pierced when Christ comes? They'd have no clue. Nobody would know. Nobody really knows what Christ looks like. You could have said, uh, John the Baptist. So, so is John the Baptist officially coming or is Moses actually coming? 
How would you know? How would any of us know if it was the literal Moses who was here or the literal John the Baptist who was here? We wouldn't know. And that's why it's not. It's in the same spirit of these people. That's why John the Baptist wasn't Elijah, but he was the type of Elijah. It'll be the same in the years to come. So the only way that this actually gets fulfilled is if it happens in the end of days that when he returns, they all mourn because they're seeing him who they've pierced. You following? Why do you think as the morning in the Valley of Megiddo in relation to the, that big attack and destruction, right? So this is all prophetic. And then what did he say? He says, then you see, there's, there's this forgiveness that takes place, right? And look at what you see in chapter 13. And in that day, in Zechariah 13, 1, and in that day, there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. Now, what's happening? <laughs> it's changing from the house of Joseph, right? Messiah ben Joseph to Messiah ben David. And you're going to say, well, why would it be changing suddenly to Messiah ben David when the fountains of water shall be opened? Okay, it's still not the fountains of water, but this forgiveness on them has happened. Okay, this forgiveness has happened. Look at this. Smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Look at this. You go back to Genesis 49. And you see the connection to the shepherd. With Joseph. See, from thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. So it's still prophetically talking about the period of time of Messiah ben Joseph. This is still the 13th year of tribulation. It's not until what? The shepherd is struck and they flee. You see, so he's pre-telling them in 12 that the shepherd is going to be struck. You see, that they should smite the shepherd. There's your word for strike. This is the second strike taking place at the end of 13 years as the two anointed ones. When the war comes to an end at the end of the sixth trumpet, the end of the 13th year of tribulation, the sixth year of trumpets. And he is, they smite him and the shepherds flee. I mean, and the, and the, the, uh, uh, those that are with him flee. So what are we seeing here? It, it's foretelling us in 12. Then at the beginning of 13, it's, it's foretelling us of when the waters will be released and then the forgiveness over all of them, okay? That's what it's saying up here. But when this, see, there shall be a fountain opened of the house of David. So it's not yet because we're still in the Joseph smiting time as Messiah ben Joseph, the ox, who gets struck, who is killed, who is one of the two witnesses. That's why it's after three, um, uh, after three and a half days for the two witnesses. Because as it was in Matthew, we see that Jonah wasn't yet fulfilled because Messiah wasn't yet three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, which means his resurrection will be sometime on the fourth day. It hasn't been fulfilled. When you see the two witnesses and you know that Messiah gets struck again as Messiah ben Joseph as the ox, there's only one place in scripture where after three days is on the third day. So three and a half days and the two witnesses resurrect, which means Messiah will go into the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And on the third day or on the fourth day, which is three and a half days, will resurrect. So all of this is still pertaining in that time as Messiah ben Joseph who is Joshua, Yeshua, the high priest and king after the order of Melchizedek when he comes at the end of seals, right to the end of the 13 years or to the end of the sixth year of trumpets when the two witnesses are killed and then boom, they go up. Now, what are we seeing? We're now seeing the end of the fulfillment of Messiah ben Joseph. 
And what did it say? Then it will be the fountain open to the house of David. Well, what do we know happens? Watch this. Let's go to our chapters to years. And look at what we see. Zechariah, or sorry, Ezekiel chapter 47. So after the death, okay, after the death and resurrection of the Messiah ben Joseph, after the sixth year of trumpets, you see, after the sixth year of trumpets or after the 13th year, which is why it's at the end of Zechariah chapter 13, this, the, the shepherd has been struck. And then what happens? Then we're going to see this period of time where the fountain of David or the fountain to the house of David will be opened. Well, let's go to Zachar uh, Ezekiel chapter 47. In Ezekiel chapter 47, check this out. In the chapters to years, Ezekiel 47 is the 14th year. And look at what it is. The water flowing from the temple. So when the water flows from the temple and the renewal is coming, what ends up happening after the end of that 14th year? What's the end of that 14th year? It's now the Jubilee. So you've got the water flowing and going out. The forgiveness of sins has now been released to all of them. And when that 14th year is over, which is when he comes as Messiah ben David, when he returns as the lion of the tribe of Judah. What did the lion of the tribe of Judah have when she saw him up in heaven in the first video that I shared? She saw him with his vestiture dipped in blood. She saw him with the fur at the bottom being dipped in blood. Because when he returns now feet down on the Mount of Olives to start the 14th year, he is coming as Messiah ben David from the line of the tribe of Judah. And his vestiture is dipped in blood. It is the 14th year, the vengeance of the Lord. The day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance. And when it's all over, the 50th year, or the 49, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, the 15th year is also a prophetic picture of the final, see, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7. Final 7th is the final Jubilee year, which we've shown from accounts all the way back from when Christ declared it in, in Luke chapter 4, which we know happened in 2020 or in 28 AD he was declaring it that 29 AD was the jubilee in the words that he said in Luke chapter 4 we followed that count and look at what it equaled the end of the 14 years 70 years ends here and when it's over he returns no longer as he was here messiah ben joseph because he hadn't yet fulfilled Messiah ben Joseph for the Jews because who are the Jews looking for? They're looking for their conquering king to destroy their enemies. They're looking for their temple, the third temple to get rebuilt. And the historical documents and these old rabbis, the ancient rabbis, they were looking for a Messiah ben Joseph who is the sacrificial ox who will come and destroy their enemies and be there in rebuilding the temple. And when the sacrifice of the ox is taking place, their atonement is complete. And he returns. Feet down on the Mount of Olives. When the water will flow at the end of it. And it gets renewed. And what happens? It's the final Jubilee. And what happens in the final Jubilee? Well we go to Zach uh, Ezekiel chapter 48. And look at what we see. Every tribe gets their land. Just like uh, Leviticus uh, chapter 26 says. I think it's 26. When they will. 25 or 26, the, the jubilee and the restoration of their lands. It's all there, guys. This is freaking crazy. It's, it's over the top. Now, let me show you something else that I discovered along the way. In Luke chapter 3, so we know Luke in order, right? Well, in Matthew, he said he was the lion, right? He was the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so we now know when he comes at the 14th year after he's fulfilled the Messiah ben Joseph as the ox, he will then return as Messiah ben Joseph, uh, uh, Messiah ben David when he comes as the lion of the tribe of Judah and his garment is blood from the treading of the grapes and so forth. Well, when we talk about Luke in order, in the prophetic end of days picture, 
We know Luke is the pre, then it's the eighth day, then the 40 days of the Son of Man. We know chapter three is what? The end of the six years of seals and the time frame of the great multitude rapture coming. Well, listen to this. Are you ready for this? Everything we've been talking about, about Messiah ben Joseph. Look at this. In Luke 3, 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. Listen to this. Being as it was supposed, the son of Joshua, the son of Joseph. Being as it was supposed, the son of Joseph. Jesus never fulfilled being the son of Joseph when he was here the first time. It was being supposed. They were believing, some of them, that he was of Joseph because of Mary and Joseph. But he wasn't fulfilling Joseph yet because when he was here the first time, he was fulfilling Messiah ben David in relation to the first sacrifice. And when he comes in the prophetic is to come of Luke chapter 3, which we have taught now for years, is the prophetic picture of when he comes at the end of the sixth year of seals. Who is he actually coming as? Messiah ben Joseph, the son of Joseph. Oh my goodness. I'm going bananas. It, I don't even know if I want to finish the rest of it. it it's, it's so unbelievable. But you know what? I've got to finish it. I've got to finish it. I know I'm like over three hours or close to three hours now. But I've got to finish it. This is just a power pack punch after knockout punch. It's beautiful. Let's keep going. We're almost done. Let's go to uh, 3138. Because some of these things, I, I, I wanted to finish it because I know we're getting late. But you've got to hear some of these things he says towards the end. In verse 12, they see him pierced through. And those who pierced him mourn for him and repent of his death. And then immediately after they repent, in chapter 13, a fountain is opened for who? For the house of David and the inhabitant of Jerusalem to absolve them of guilt. Mm. And when they are absolved by the cleansing waters, evil is undone. They are washed clean. His death has atoned for their sins. And of course, we can go back again to Deuteronomy. Their de his death has atoned for their sins. At the rushing of the water. Do you understand this hasn't happened yet? 33, 17. The Messiah promised to Joseph is a firstborn ox, and every firstborn ox is destined to die as a sacrifice. <laughs> Unbelievable. It is all there. Now we're going to go into this part two one, and just, oh, <laughs> let me show you this other piece in relation to what we were talking about when the lands are divided into the nations, right? Into each tribe. Look at this. Where do you find it also? In Joshua. In Joshua, when they divide the country in Joshua 18 into 19, it's the same prophetic picture at the end of Joshua, who is that prophetic picture of Christ, when the final year is over as the Messiah ben Joseph, Joshua, then what happens is there's the dividing of the lands. It's, it's everywhere. I mean, you want to talk about clarity now. This is, it's, it's, it's getting over the top. Well, now watch this one. This one won't be too long, but we're going to go through it. And so we've also. All right. Let's have a listen to this. So done another podcast on the structure of Psalms. And basically what's interesting is that if you actually look at Psalms as a book, uh, Psalms one and two have been considered by scholars as actually the introduction to the whole of the book. It's, it's the yeah. message of the book of the Psalms. Pillars at the doorway of the book of Psalms. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so you, in sharing a little bit about Psalm one and two, and by the way, the rabbis, the ancient rabbinic commentators actually argue that Psalm 1 and 2 are one, are one, are one because yeah. of all the language that joins them together. Yeah, it's, it's, right. It should be read as one. Right. But you said something interesting. You said that you argue that in Psalm 1 is the presentation of a Joseph-like Messiah. A Joseph and a Joshua-like Messiah. And yes. then in chapter 2 of Psalms, a Davidic Messiah. So that, that's right. Could you, um, could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, well, the Messiah in Psalm 1 is like Joshua. He has to meditate on the Torah day and night. And this is what Joshua was told to do. He must meditate in Torah night and day. That's Joshua chapter one. That's yep. Joshua chapter one. But he's also like Joseph because he is like a tree planted by streams of water. Now, if we go back to Genesis 49, Joseph is this, the plant that springs up from the from dry ground and its branches go over the wall. So the tree planted by streams of water is a picture of Joseph. And um, so we have in Psalm one, a Joseph and a Joshua Messiah. But as soon as we turn to Psalm two, we have a Messiah who sits on Mount Zion. So he's a Messiah from David's line. And um, 
we have to understand that this, these two Psalms together tell the story of the book of Psalms from the beginning to the end. He is the, the Messiah, is the wise man who meditates in Torah. He will prosper in his time, even against much opposition, because his roots are in beside yeah. the streams of water, and in the end he will rule his en and conquer his enemies from Mount Zion. They are the one Messiah, but in Psalm 1 he's painted as Joseph and Joshua, and in Psalm 2 he's painted as David. Yeah, he starts as Joseph and he finishes as David. Exactly. So that starts as Joseph and finishes as David. <clears throat> What he was just talking about there was what I said we would go back to when you go to Genesis 49. In Genesis 49, we saw, remember, it's in the last days. So we're being told this in the last days. So who is he? A fruitful bow uh, by a well. His branches run over a wall. Okay? This is all connected. Who are the ones that are responsible for rebuilding the wall? or the, the prophetic picture of the wall, which is built during the first half of trumpets when the city and the streets and the wall are being rebuilt. It's the first half of trumpets. And who's there? The Messiah Ben Joseph. And fruitful bow. Why, why fruitful? Right? The ones that bear fruit? It's, it's like John 15, when he talks about he's the vine, and, and, and the, they have to go and produce fruit, or they're going to be cut down. You see, and he's the shepherd, and, and the sheep will be scattered at the end when, he's, when, he, when the sacrifice comes. But what did he also say? Once he's completed Joseph, then he's going to also come, and he's going to be the ruling and reigning from Zion in Jerusalem, not in the, in the mid-trib, but in the post-trib when he's going to rule and reign for the millennial reign. Well, who is he coming as? Remember, we just said that that's when he will return feet down on the Mount of Olives, when he will come as as the as the final conquering king, when his when his uh, um, his garment as the lion is, is dipped in blood because it's it's in that final 14th year when he destroys the enemies and then he will rule for the thousand years. Well, check it out. Look what happens when we go to Judah, just like we said near the beginning in Matthew we see that he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. But he's not returning as the lion of the tribe of Judah again till it's all over. And look at what it says. Judah is a lion's whelp. A lion, verse uh, 10 of chapter 49 of Genesis. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh, which is Messiah, come. And unto him shall be the gathering of the people be, binding his fowl, unto the vine comma and his ass is colt unto the choice vine so he's coming and he's got a fowl and he's got a colt okay he's got two he's got two do you know that that only happens one time in the gospels it's not in mark nor is it in luke unto the choice vine he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes when is this? When he comes as Messiah ben David, the, the conquering king who is the lion of the tribe of Judah, which is in the 14th year when he returns feet down and he destroys those enemies in the grapes of wrath in the final 14th year. Well, what does it say? The fowl and the ass. Do you know that that's only found in Matthew's gospel? I think it's chapter 21. And what do we know? About the triumphal entry in the prophetic. I've showed that in the in the intro series, you can go to the prophetic picture of the pre, mid, and post revealed in the Luke, Mark, Matthew, resurrection story, triumphal entry, and transfiguration. So what is the triumphal entry typology in the prophetic of Matthew 21? It's when the Lord returns, as we've been teaching for years. It's when the Lord returns at the end of the 13th year, when he returns to start the 14th year, feet down on the Mount of Olives. And what is he doing? He's going to gather the nations to the treading of the winepress of the grapes of wrath of Almighty God, which is Revelation chapter 19. And what does it say about him? It's the same picture. It's the 100% same timing as, as what it said in the last days in Genesis 49. And it's when he will be the lion of the tribe of Judah, the, the lion of David. And what does it say? Only found in Matthew 21, here in verse 2, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and the straight way 
uh, uh, end the straight way, ye shall see, you shall, sorry, you shall find an ass tied, comma, and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. Do you realize this only happens in Matthew's gospel? It's clearly a contradiction, as we've said, in the difference in the gospels from Luke and from Mark. It is only discussed in Matthew 21 at his triumphal entry story and in the revelations that we have proven out over all of these years and the differences of the Gospels, we have shown that that is the beginning of the 14th year. And according to what it said in Genesis chapter 49, it is a perfect 100% typology to what would happen in the last days when he will then return fulfilling the line of the tribe of Judah, the line of the tribe of David, when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives to destroy their enemies and then will renew the earth as he said he would through the house of David when the waters go out after he's destroyed these enemies here and the waters will flow out and then it will be the final jubilee and they will all return to receive their portions of land and the millennial reign will begin. Brothers and sisters, I hope this blows your mind as it has mine. I am so excited by this. I'm going to finish up here this, this final minute and a half and listen to what he says. That actually then makes sense of what you found in your research, that the bookends of the book of Psalms, David is emphasized, and in the middle of the book of Psalms, Joseph, Joseph is emphasized. Let me read again about his sufferings in Egypt uh, and all the rest of it. So maybe we can summarize this, you know, what we said in this episode, just kind of to, to help our viewers. You, basically, the question came up, you introduced to us something that you know we hadn't much thought about, and that is that there's not just one Messiah promised in the Hebrew Bible, there are four types, types four of types. Messiah, four types. right? And we hadn't ever considered that before. And you talked about um, a prophetic type Messiah, you talked about an Aaronic type Messiah, you've talked about a Messiah son of Joseph and a Messiah son of David. And what we've said is that, you know, you could conclude that there are four different Messiahs, but biblically we actually start to see- The biblical writers themselves, especially Zechariah, want to combine the two main messiahs, Messiah ben Yosef and Messiah ben David. Zechariah wants to combine them. And in a sense, well, if we're talking about Yeshua, the New Testament tells us, the book of Hebrews tells us, he is also the priest messiah. And the prophet, well, Jesus, Yeshua was a prophet, but then of course, Malachi tells us that the prophet uh, Elijah will yeah. come before the great day of the Lord and Jesus identifies him with John, with, with John Baptist. So it's comp- uh, He even finishes by saying, after having said this connection to Moses, and John the Baptist, that he then goes on and says, see, we've also got the connection to Elijah, to the John the Baptist. But we know, and we can now prove in, the, in, in all of Scripture, that he is the prophet Messiah coming for the 40 days. He is the Messiah ben Joseph, but also simultaneously the Melchizedek, Messiah Melchizedek. He is both high priest and of the line of Judah. He's going to fulfill that for the Jews, for this priestly line in trumpets from the end of seals and through trumpets. He is the ox that is still to be sacrificed. And then, so that covers the three. And then when he returns, when it's all over and he returns feet down, destroys the enemy, dipped in the blood and everything else, he is coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah as the Messiah ben David and will rule and reign from the earth for a thousand years, just as he told, you guessed it, only in Matthew, which is the end of tribulation, because the end is, is Luke, Mark, and then Matthew. And what do you see? He tells them, now you're going to go and teach the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And at the very end of the gospel, 28 verse 20, teaching them, to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. This is not just, you know, he's with us in our hearts throughout to the end of the world. No, this is the literal prophetic understanding of the revelation when he returns as Messiah ben David, as the lion of the tribe of Judah, and will now be with them until the end of the world. Brothers and sisters, I pray this has fired you up as it has me. This, this was powerful. This gave us so much more connection to these things that we have been digging into and drawing closer to and understanding. But 
there was still little parts and pieces that we need clarity on. Oh my goodness, has that ever been fulfilled today? Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless you. Thank you for being a part of this journey with me and my family and all of our brothers and sisters around the world. I am fired up. I'm not going to sleep for a couple more hours. <laughs> but man, it's so exciting. I pray it blesses you. I love you all and we'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.